so um, I think Hisham's going to help out there. Thanks, Hisham. Um, so we're going to start, guys. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, so share screen. Here we go. Okay, play from current slide. All right, cool. Okay, so I mean, uh, in essence, we do have um, we do have some uh, like a chat box, so you guys can feel free to put anything you want in the chat if you have any questions or any concerns or anything like that. Um, but do make sure you put your email, your name, and your email address just for CE. And I did want to welcome everybody here today. So. Um, uh, we are uh, going to be recording um, today's session, so I'll post that on our uh, YouTube channel. And if you YouTube um, Ontario Dental Implant Network, you'll be able to find some of the previous lectures that we did. There's some surgeries there as well, um, and then also some past any webinars or lectures that we do. We typically, um, I, I, I have almost 120 subscribers, which I'm quite impressed about. Uh, but anyways, moving on. <laughs> so today's agenda is pretty straightforward. Um, we don't have to do any sign-in. Uh, the sign-in is really going to be your name and email address. And then you will have to, if they ask you for proof of CE, I will send out the CE credit, the email for the CE certificate, but you will have to list the verification code at the end for it to be valid, okay? We're going to go through our treatment planning topic, um, but we will, before that, review a, member, a few member cases and, over some, and some over-the-shoulder review. All of this stuff is really gonna focus on treatment planning. And I know some of you are, are, are just starting out your careers, some of you are more advanced, so I tried to mix things up so that hopefully everybody can benefit. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and also I'll just mention if you can put yourself on mute, although I think we've muted everybody. Um, any upcoming over-the-shoulder surgeries also, um, and our next meeting. I think somebody's drawing on the screen, so if you guys can not draw on the screen, that would be great. Let me just see how to get rid of that. Uh, we might not be able to, hang on. Disable attendee annotation. Shows. Okay. I'm not sure how to get rid of that. Uh, can you guys see that okay? Hang on, here we go, okay. Yeah, we can see it, uh, Azim, but we just still see the um, see the markings that are there. Yeah, let me just see if I can get rid of that somehow. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to restart sharing my screen, and let's see if that gets rid of it. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. You're good to go. Okay. All right, guys, so just try not to touch anything that you shouldn't touch on there. I know everybody gets kind of crazy with the buttons in front of them on their keyboards, um, but do make sure you sign in, okay, on the group, on the chat. Um, and uh, uh, for AGD, as I mentioned, Category 2 credits. So this is the calendar. Um, we'll talk about our next meeting. It's, it's, it's supposed to be November 18th. It's supposed to be on suturing. It will be on suturing. Um, the goal is to have this hands-on. And, uh, you know, right now I think Brampton is in its second or third week of, uh, or second week of Stage 2 modified. York Region just started their Stage 2 um, this Monday. So we're going to have to see where things lie so that we can hopefully do a hands-on session. But I really wanted to do a hands-on with suturing, and I was going to get surgical room involved to help supply some of the things so we can do a uh, focus really on some things, which I'll talk about at the end. Okay, but this is the list of our upcoming meetings that we still have. I make sure you visit the website, the events calendar as well. I always update it with over-the-shoulder surgeries. Just make sure you check with me because sometimes things change, especially with COVID. We've had a few changes in our schedule. Um, and uh, also we had some issues with our suctions. We weren't able to do surgery on Monday. So just kind of always check with me. And then of course you're able to come and observe. We're limiting it back now to one doctor only given the new, um, you know, the new regulations for stage two modified. So just an FYI, it's first come first serve, but I'll try to do my best to accommodate everybody. And um, it, you need to make sure you bring all your PPE, okay? Um, as far as the, um, uh, the group chat, just make sure you do put one thread per topic. And then I always list some cases on the Facebook. I know I've been directing you guys over to the Facebook page and also I have an Instagram as well. So we do have sponsors. Obviously a lot of this stuff is not possible without sponsors um, to support us and provide us things to be able to help out. So we do have some sponsors here today. Um, for Denmat, um, I'm not sure if Bruce is on the line. Bruce, are you here if so you can type in your chat and then i can unmute you 
Um, but I don't believe I see Bruce on here. Um, let me just check. No, I don't. But Bruce Tuck, who is with Denmat, um, because they've had some changes, is, uh, is, uh, is kind of helping us out with all things Denmat. And um, we're lucky enough to have um, Henry Shine, who's now the distributor, who now we can go to for product questions, because Denmat didn't have a rep in Ontario or Canada for that matter for quite some time. So all these products that they have as far as, um, you know, headlight, uh, lights, perioptics, the lasers. Um, and last time we had a gentleman who was helping us out with the lasers, um, you know, the STM program and even instrumentation, which I'm still working on. Uh, that's all going to go through Henry Shine. And I've been working with them to develop some really competitive pricing so that things are still, you know, working well for us in the Odin group. Um, now, one thing with the STM program, um, the course itself, uh, because of logistics and what's going on with stage two and uncertainty, that's actually been canceled. Uh, that was scheduled for December 4th. So um, as of now, we've removed that session and uh, we are going to go back and uh, go back to the drawing board and see kind of where things are at with that program. Um, so it's unfortunate. Um, there are a few webinars that I have done for Denmat that might be able to help you initially in the interim, just present the program to your staff and maybe get an idea as far as what the program's about. But unfortunately at this point, um, the course is on hold and I will keep you guys updated as to when we're running the next course. But from the looks of it, it may not be till March or April of next year. Um, so I'll keep you posted, okay? And as I mentioned, they do have some great instruments, um, uh, the Dr. Shig Implant Kit, which I use. And I'm still working on instrumentation and pricing. So I haven't forgot about that as a group purchase. Hopefully we can work something. And that'll be again through Henry Schein. Um, uh, Surgical Clean Air also has, has done a, a, a great job with us just to secure the good, great pricing. They're still offering competitive pricing, not as good as we initially got, but these things are really uh, great for patients to see, especially now. And I know, Neil, we were just talking about that as well, about how, how patients really appreciate having that in, getting your HVAC tested. So. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to uh, Jeff. And again, he is not responsible for the delivery. He's been working hard to try to do whatever he can to get everything delivered to everybody, really. Okay, but uh, his job is really just securing product and pricing. All right. Um, uh, we're also fortunate enough to have Shah, Shah as a sponsor. As you know, they've, they've helped us out with uh, not only managing our cases. Um, we were supposed to have our, this meeting. Actually, they graciously offered their new CE. I went down there, it's really nice. Um, they were gonna doll it up for us, but unfortunately that got put on the back burner. So hopefully we can have a meeting there at some point, but it's a beautiful facility, state of the art, um, huge, very well organized. And again, they've always offered us special discounts on their lab work. Um, and as you know, they're, because we're talking about treatment planning today, uh, the first thing and most important thing I will tell you is work with a good lab. I can't stress that enough. I just had another doctor who I've completed, I finished the implant surgery went on and the doctor went and sent it to a lab and I'm telling you that this, this work got sent back three or four times. There were stock abutments, they weren't trimmed properly, they were too big, they were hitting the bone. I mean, this was just a nightmare and, and really it's important to work with a lab and this again, this is a case that we did with Shaw Digital um, you know, uh, digital scans, and we'll talk a bit about that on treatment planning, to be able to really work with your lab and develop a proper prosthetic plan, I cannot stress enough. You have to work with an experienced lab who knows what we're doing. Again, I just did an all-on case. We finished the case, and now it went for prosthetics. And this prosthetic, full arch, has now been reinserted and reinserted seven times. And I'm still not happy with the design of it. So I can't stress enough how much savings you can get. You, you may be saving something somewhere else, but wow, I mean, the ability to have things go smoothly and have the experience that Shaw has is really invaluable, okay? So I can't stress that enough. Um, so I just wanted to bring on um, uh, Ali, uh, just to say a few words from Shaw. Um, so I will unmute your audio, and I think I can also um, make a co-host. And there you go. So Ali, did you, uh, did you want to jump on here? Oh. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Sheikh, for the uh, opportunity. I'm just gonna get take two minutes uh, uh, of your time. So hello, doctors. Uh, my name is Ali Rezai, and I'm the CEO of Shaw Lab Group. Uh, we've been serving Ontario for over 76 years, uh, so one of the oldest labs, but as Dr. Sheikh said, we have one of the mo most modern labs as well today. So we have four labs in Ontario, um, GTA, London, Kingston, and Ottawa. Um, I do wanna thank Dr. Shea for his continued trust in our technicians, continued support of our business, and uh, congratulations to all of you for choosing Odin. I, uh, we deal with, with different study clubs, and I, I gotta say, it is for sure the leading implant network in Ontario. I have no doubt about that. And, um, you know, I was really looking forward to meeting everybody today in our facility, but it has to be, it had to be postponed. I, I would say it's postponed, but we'll meet soon. Having said that, if any of you are interested in visiting our lab, uh, please, uh, we are in York Del Mall area, just drop a line and we will, uh, we will, it will be our pleasure, pleasure to have you here for a tour. And it gives you a chance, as Dr. Sheikh said, to see the latest digital technology and how that how it can grow your practice and customer satisfaction. You also will have time to meet one-on-one uh, -on -one with our great specialized technicians and have conversations with them to see if you want to give us a try or not. The last point, today at 9.30 p.m., you will receive an email from us with some useful information. Please take a minute to read it uh, before you delete it. And uh, once again, it's a pleasure to support Odin and thank you everybody and thank you Dr. Sheikh for, for your for your continued support and time. Thanks. No, thank you Ali and Mike I know is on board as well. Many of you have uh, I know Mike very well. So, um, uh, but uh, you know, they've always been there to support, um, you know, they also support Tide as well. So they're very familiar with the implant industry and uh, what we need to do to get uh, good, good work done. And they've also been able to help us out with costs. So I really appreciate um, uh, everything that you guys have done for us. And again, an integral part of what? Treatment planning, because you need to work, as I mentioned, with a really good lab in order to be able to get a good result for your patient. Um, so moving on to Henry Schein, we've been fortunate enough to have this year, Henry Schein jump on board as a sponsor. I've been with Henry Schein for years. I know some of you have been as well. Um, so, um, you know, they've been great as far as, you know, service and support for myself. I know other members, we were talking at the last meeting about that. So I just wanted to introduce, um, you know, Steve uh, Cumberford from Henry Schein. I know he wanted, he was just going to say a few words. I know some of you had the opportunity to meet him um, last time. So Steve, if you want to jump on there. Thank you, Dr. Sheikh. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to, uh, to meet up with your members. I really do value the, the relationship uh, with, your, with your group. So um, I know Jamie's gonna tie in a little bit, uh, a little bit more in the presentation, but I did wanna leave one thing with you and I wanna make sure that we bring value to these um, events every month. And one thing that, uh, that Jamie's going to share with you, but the other one is over the last couple of months is around um, regaining some of the production and, and, and really coming out of the summer and, and looking at this year into next year and looking at, to, again, recovering production and looking at value for, for your practices. And one thing that's come up, which is a hidden secret at Henry Schein, is a, a practice analysis. Not, I don't know if you, Dr. Shake, have had one with, with Mike or not, but over the last couple of months, it's really brought a lot of value back to the practice. It doesn't get into merchandise and sundries, but it really gets at the heart of the practice and where you can really regain some, some revenues and look at opportunities. So just as a thought, leave you with a little um, thought provoker for, for later and any other discussions, but um, is to look at, at where Shine can bring back some value to, to, to your practices. And with that, um, I'll pass it over to Jamie. Yeah, and Steve, actually, I did have the PAT done. I've had it done probably a good maybe six, seven years ago. Ooh, um, okay. And uh, and I probably do for another one, but it was an amazing kind of tool just to see where things were at. They look at your hygiene and, you know, the frequency of your x-rays and what you're doing as far as standards, which at that point, we didn't really have any 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, I think uh, it was great to just kind of bring certain things to light. And I can only imagine how beneficial it is now um, in a practice given what's going on and where things are kind of missing. So thanks for bringing that up. And that's a, that's a complimentary service you guys offer too, right? It is. It's, it's a consulting service that, you know, it could cost a couple thousand dollars really, but it's, it's complimentary. And, and it's, uh, it brings out a lot of good um, things to think of, like two, three, four, five things that you can think about. Yeah. And um, if you do it on a recurring basis, which it sounds like you are due, um, it really, it, it really uh, gives you, do some pause to think on, on retooling and hygiene and team synergy these days is a big topic as you said a little earlier yeah. and um, it's brought up a lot of uh, good conversations for sure awesome no great um, so Jamie I'm just gonna so we had some questions on the thank you so much Steve really appreciate you jumping on thank you um, and all your support uh, I did want to bring on there were some discussions on the thread about digital scanners and um, you know how they can play into helping you with dentistry. And now, given the fact that we have more downtime with our patients, this is kind of the perfect opportunity. If you're getting into digital, you have digital, to be able to do a lot more with that. And of course, it can help you with your treatment planning. And I showed you guys a case that we did with Shaw just earlier with scanning and being able to do digital wax up. So I, I, I just kind of last minute kind of begged Jamie to see if he could jump on here for like five, six minutes just to kind of go through it and kind of bring to light a few of the scanners and how Henry Shine can kind of help. So thanks a lot for joining us last minute, Jamie. Um, so just uh, go for it, buddy. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dr. Shook. I appreciate it. Uh, I did have the opportunity to join last year at one of the events and I can say I am missing the food, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. It was a great event and, and again, I appreciate the time today and our partnership with you um, and your members for that matter. So in terms of the digital workflow, then I am the digital specialist here in, in uh, Toronto, uh, about six and a half years now with Henry Shine as the digital CAD CAM specialist. And it all resolves around a um, common theme of Connect Dental, which is enhancing the patient experience, providing uh, predictable quality dentistry, and improving efficiency and productivity. Sounds pretty simple. I mean, that, that is the mantra, and that's what we aim for. Uh, and I'm one of the consultants, so I try and look for, with our clients, the best solution, not necessarily the product, but what the solution and the workflow that we're looking for. So we do this um, through you know, a series of meetings or, and discussions and demonstrations. So um, we have a couple of different offerings that we carry, if we can just move over to the next um, uh, image here. Um, three of the most popular ones we carry right now are the new Prime Scan from, from Densply Serona. Um, 50,000 images per second, very high performing scanner. I uh, would argue the highest performing scanner on the market today. Um, along with its uh, integration to um, CEREC system uh, for same day restorations, but also its uh, direct export to the laboratory. Um, the Trios from 3Shape as well has been very popular, and it comes in a couple of different configurations, be it the uh, pod version uh, or the card version as shown here. Uh, and there's a lot of different software with the Trios that we could discuss as well from a patient excitement standpoint. So Dr. Shake, you mentioned about delving into and, and researching a little bit more what can be done with the digital workflow. Um, things like smile design, you can overlay uh, an aesthetic case on a patient right away and, and, and discuss what we could look like with an aesthetic case done based on the software and, and maneuvering uh, and moving the teeth. Um, things like patient monitoring, where you can actually see what's happened over time. A scan was happened six months later, we can see that there's been uh, wear or there's been recession. So the tools are not just we're sending an impression anymore for a lot more. So I'd like to just mention, you know, give us a call. Uh, let's have the discussions. Let's talk about what's going to be most important for your practice and your patients. And we could look at a solution that would tailor that, um, you know, depending on, on what's most important uh, and some of the, um, the different uh, tools or, or aspects you can use with the scanner. And we can come up with a, a good package for, for your practice. Uh, a couple of the ones that we have here addressed in, in some of the promotions. It, it is Q4, so I just wanted to mention there is, uh, you know, some, some pretty uh, aggressive promotions on that next slide. So what that shows is uh, a Densply Serona World uh, promotion for, for their scanner and their system. So it's pretty attractive. It's a $5,000 discount on their scanner and close to $25,000 off their CEREC system. Uh, Three Shape Trios just recently has... Um, provided us with a, a couple of refurbished uh, Trios 3 wireless units. And the Trios 3 is one of the scanners that we'll send to Invisalign. I, I believe 
you know, some people have had questions about, hey, how come no scanners can send to Invisalign anymore? Uh, the Trios, you still can. So, so that's a key piece to remember. Uh, and it's a very popular scanner from a, an accuracy and speed standpoint. Okay. And uh, with the, I guess, we wrote root recovery a program that we have with Henry Schein Financial, um, you can take advantage of some delayed or deferred payments, uh, interest-free as well with by Serona's offering. So a couple, couple mentions there on, on the different products. I mean, the key is, depending on what you're looking for, uh, if you're doing a, a lot of um, you know, crown and bridge, uh, if you want something that's going to give a little bit more patient interaction, if you're looking just to scan, that's all you want. Or if you want to add on, you know, additional softwares like uh, implant, uh, prosthetically driven implant planning and placement, you know, we can look at softwares like that, as well as it partners with the lab, for instance, with, with Shaw and, and, and do that together. So let us know. Uh, we're here to help as consultants. Um, I'll leave my, uh, my contact, I guess, at the end of, uh, um, of the presentation here. Uh, but feel free to reach out and book a time to either do it via Zoom or in the office. Um, obviously, we can uh, we can look to accommodate your needs that way. Awesome. Okay. Well, this is uh, Jamie's contact info, and I will send out an email just when I send out the CE. So if anybody has any questions, I think Jamie, you you will you come to their office if they want? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I've got the scanners. Um, I've got a, a, a nice setup actually, a CAD CAM room dedicated at the office in Vaughan. I'm, uh, you know, I'm mobile to go to the office with the equipment, um, depending on um, you know, what's the best suited. So I like to assess first, you know, we have some questions to find out, you know, what might be the best solution. We talk about um, applications, obviously, you know, uh, you know, the piece that comes up price, obviously the different price points and, and where they sit and, um, you know, what the overall um, goal is for the digital workflow in the office. Perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, jumping on that. I really appreciate it. And hopefully that was uh, helpful to some of those members. I know a lot of people are always asking about digital and when should I get in and how, how best to do the workflow and stuff. So I'll leave that all to your expertise. Yeah, we've been having a lot of conversations, especially lately. So um, yeah, I look forward to it. Thanks so yeah, much. Awesome. No, thank you so much, Jamie. Appreciate it. Um, so then, of course, our uh, last, um, uh, our another additional sponsor is uh, Hi Austin. They've always been there to support us in every which way and possible. So we do have our Advanced Implant Surgical Continuum. Uh, that's going to be November 28th, and that'll be in my office under mentorship. So just make sure you reach out to uh, Har Simran or Dinesh um, to get that booked. I am reviewing cases. We're starting to get more and more cases, so it should be a really fun day. Um, they also have the One Guide. So for treatment planning, you know, with those doctors who are just starting out or a bit anxious, or even those advanced cases, um, you know, going guided really helps, right, to, to alleviate a lot of stress during the surgery um, for pre-planning. So uh, this is, again, just uh, the one guide system, which uh, I've lectured on, and, you know, you get a document, so you have to send them the CT, you know, you, you, know, you got to send them the impressions and, and digital uh, or analog, and then they'll go through the report, They'll, you know, they'll, they'll put an implant in the optical position, and then you can go ahead and you can have a guide fabricated. So um, again, I'm trying to keep everything towards treatment planning and how we can improve our treatment planning skills so that things are gonna go smoother for you and the patient, right? That's the bottom line. So as far as any um, confirmations or anything like that, just reply yes or no. Obviously it's not a big deal for today, but it would have been if we were <laughs> you know, doing this in person. Um, I just need to know so we can get figure out numbers. Okay, um, so just a few questions and cases from members. So this is Dr. Tse. I'm not sure if he's on today, but he had ha he had um, d uh, placed an implant. Um, I'm guessing maybe about a year or two ago, and uh, you know um, placed it was an immediate anterior case. He placed the implant in in a pretty good position that he thought, and he restored the case. And uh, the patient actually came back to have a, an additional implant therapy. A CT scan was taken. And uh, lo and behold, you can see here that there is little to no buccal plate here, right? And so when we go back and we look at this case, you know, what can we do for a case like that? Because it, it happens. It happens to the best of us. And, you know, we talk about palpably positioning our implant. And one of the tricks and tips that I showed you guys is, even in a socket, you know, taking your mold 2-4 and just shoving it down the palatal area so that you can literally slip your drill down and feel the palatal bone and then come up and go right in. So you really know you're engaging the palatal. Because I've seen this has happened to me. 
And I'm going to show you a case right now that it did. And, you know, what do you do in this situation? So the patient's asymptomatic. Obviously, the tissue is very thin, so you can see through the implant. Um, and the implant was placed, you know, what he thought palatal, but it probably slipped into the socket. And this happens when you're first starting to do these cases, which is why you got to be super mindful. So what happens when you have no buccal plate on the implant? So this is a case that I did for a patient. And we winded up placing implants. And you can see there's really no bone here. So the implant shouldn't have gone in, but the patient really wanted immediates. So we placed the implant. We added bone. Again, I'm not, I don't want to go through the whole treatment process. But to make a long story short, the tissue was still very thin. And when we took a CT scan, the bone was not fully discernible. Okay. So in a case like this, I sent the patient to get restored, um, having, th having thought, you know, everything will be okay, might be okay, talked to the patient about options. He said, ah, not interested, let's restore it. Patient ran into some financial difficulties. I later get the case back when he's ready to restore, and now there's a buccal fistula draining from the buccal. And when I go in and I take off the healing abutment, there's exited and there's a gap. There's about a seven to 10 millimeter probing depth on the buckle of the implant. So what do you do here, right? Take it out, regraft, you know, wait, put another implant in, you know, what, where do we, where do we go from here? So this patient, I talked to about the, all, all the options of opening the tissue up. Um, it seemed like it was a soft tissue issue, although there was a bony problem as well. So what we opted to do at this point was, I used a modified Orban, we split the tissue, we cleaned out or I cleaned out internally through the socket, because there's no crown here, right? It's the healing abutment. Cleaned out all the granulation tissue and the threads of the implant as best I could. And then I created a pouch and a tunnel. And then I took a connective tissue graft and I stuffed that in and sutured that area up, okay? So the goal being to thicken up the tissue. So we let that heal for about six weeks and the tissue now is nice and thick, it's robust, um, the tissue looks a lot better, looks a lot healthier, the patient is aware, you know, that the bone is not 100%, but this was the compromise that we provided this patient. And I'll show you another option later on, where again, opening up the site, especially once the crown is there and all the prosthetics are there, it's a lot harder to do and access that site internally, right, without removing the work. So, these are some of the things that we all have to face with, and it really starts off with treatment planning. You know, it would have been nice to just not put the implant in that day, add some bone. I got a little crazy here. Even the implant is 18 millimeters engaged in the floor of the nose. So again, these are things that, you know, you see, should we have done it, should we not? There's a whole, you know, this, that, and the other. And I've done cases like this, and they've gone right. This is one of them that didn't go as best as I wanted it. But the implant is completely integrated. And again, my option, the options we, we presented based on what the patient wanted was to thicken up the soft tissue. So leading to another doctor, this is Dr. Miller's case, uh, to one immediate molar uh, that he had treatment plan and a lower implant. Um, this is what the uh, bone looked like. Um, so you'll see that there is a concavity, a lingual concavity here. So when you're looking at the CTs, and again, we're talking about treatment planning, right? You're looking at when you place this implant, what are you gonna encounter? What's the quality of the bone that you think you're going to encounter when you're placing an implant? Is it softer? Is it more radiolucent? Is it harder, meaning more radiopaque? Where is the cortical bone? You know, is there a bevel on the buckle? Where is the nerve? For the upper, what is the quality of the bone? Is it really opaque? Is it soft? Where's the position of the sinus? Is it corticated? Can you see the cortication on the floor of the sinus? Right, these are all things when you're treatment planning a case, you need to know how to use your CT, it can help you. Many of us get CTs or we get x-rays, but we're not using them, we're gonna talk about that. So this was a little bit about the scope of, of, of the doctor. So um, this is the CT scan and it even shows an osseous defect. This means that the bone is not going to be hard there. And if you're relying on crustal stability of your implant, because tapered implants are what we use, and as we put the implant in, it gets tighter at the top. We may not get that because the crustal, there's a defect in the bone there. So we have to understand, or I have to understand, when I'm placing this implant, I'm going to look to the apex to be able to get stability. For the upper, I'm looking at the roots here. This is an immediate molar. What is the position of the roots? When I take out the tooth, how thick is the bone? Are the roots splayed? So you need to look at 
the upper left, which is called the axial slice. Are they separating into three roots? And if so, how much interceptal bone is there, right? Does it splay only at the tip or is it splaying all the way down so you'll have lots of interceptal bone? So this axial slice right up here on the upper left is really important to look at. And many of us don't look at that slicing as we're going through the tooth. Where are the root tips? You'll see it says in number two that the root tip is really far buccal. So we may get a buccal plate perforation there. We have to check that after we take the tooth out. All right? So treatment planning your case really means looking at the CT properly. And we're going to talk about that. Mucositis. How thick is the sinus membrane? Muc the thicker, the better, the less risk of perforation. If you see mucositis, that's a good thing. Okay? If it's chronic sinusitis and the whole cavity is filled, well, that's a problem, okay? But thicker membrane is good, all right? And now here is the actual implant plan. And again, this is planned by somebody who doesn't do implant surgery. So take it for what it's worth. They're putting a four and a half. I never use a four and a half for a molar. I don't need to here. I could use a 5.0. Again, they're putting a seven millimeter implant, right? But look, the seven millimeter implant is not touching the apical portion, where, which is cortical bone. So for me, I don't want to put a seven. I want to put an eight and a half, even a 10, to be able to engage that sinus floor, which is cortical bone. Is it very corticated? Uh, not really, because again, it blends in with the trabecular bone. So these are all things, when I'm doing the casket here, am I going to feel a drop? Or am I not going to feel as much of a drop? And here, I may not feel as much of a drop because it's not as corticated. So these are all things you need to look at when you're treatment planning your cases. Not just, oh, I can put this in there, but what is the bone? What are the nuances of the CT that can help you with case success? This is the lower left, again, showing that buccal def that cortical defect at the crest, that concavity. So we know if we're doing a guided surgery, your drills, especially if you have an open channel, your drills are gonna push you towards the buccal, right? That's gonna happen. Right? If you start drilling on cortical bone and you, you, know, you don't prepare it properly, your implant's going to start skating on that cortical bone because it's so hard. So you need to see these things so that if something happens during the surgery, you're not freaking out. In fact, you're like, oh, wait a minute. That's just the cortical bone. Now I know I need to prepare the site more to be able to, you know, maybe to be able to engage that area better. These are things that you need to look at so that when you go, when it gets time to surgery, you've memorized this picture. So I have two surgeries tomorrow. I memorize their CTs. I have them up. I can slice them. I can do, but I know exactly what is going to happen, what could happen. And I have some backup plans, which we're going to get to. So this is the actual case because I wanted it doing it for the, uh, the patient was referred to me. So again, because the axial slice showed that the, the tooth, Fricated very high up, I knew I'd have some good septal bone. So again, I sectioned the root in three because that's what this axial slice showed. I was able to use my cast kit drill. You can see once I did my cast kit drill and I lifted the sinus, I then removed the roots, and you'll see there's the floor of the sinus. You can see it. But did I feel that drop through? No, I didn't because I knew I wasn't going to because it wasn't corticated on the CT. So I placed the implant in the optimal position, and then we grafted the rest, okay? We did a little bit of a sinus bump, grafted the rest with bone, and then we put some PRF over here as a poncho. And now people say, well, what's gonna happen to that? It heals, you just gotta give it time. You can see where the original area where the soft tissue margin used to be, and then that granulates by secondary intention. And then we were able to go ahead and make the patient his final crown. This is just the day of insert, so the soft tissue is gonna fold over there. Um, as far as the lower, using your guide pin okay using taking a guide pin x-ray is one thing even putting the guide pin in the patient's mouth is one thing but using it looking at it is it centered in this case it looks like it's a little bit distal and this is why you got to take intro photos you can't see that in the third quad it's very hard for you to see that your assistant can but you can't see that okay using a five millimeter guide pin here because i want to see with the two millimeter hole, what does that look like all the way around? I want to check my depth. So I need to know the measurements. Three, five, seven, and 10. 
where am I? You can also notice that the bone slopes. So when I drill and my stopper hits, if I'm drilling to 10, am I gonna have a 10 millimeter hole? Anybody? No, I'm just kidding. No, I won't because the drill stopper is hitting those edges of those peaks of bone. So I know if I need to place a 10 millimeter implant in here, I actually need to use a 11 and a half, sometimes even a 13 millimeter drill. So these are things that you need to be aware of because guess what? You think you're placing a 10 millimeter implant. You drill to 10 and you think it's 10, but it's only eight and a half. And now you put your implant in and you keep torquing, keep torquing, but the implant's not gonna cut apically because remember, there's even cortical bone there. So you're gonna keep torquing and now all of a sudden, boom, your implant's gonna start spinning. So you have to understand these things when you're doing a surgery to account for if shit hits the fan, why is that happening? And that you're not surprised, okay? So I place this implant. I actually prepped this with a 13 millimeter drill, okay? Put the implant in a couple millimeters sub uh, about two millimeters subcrestal. So I wanted to get a really nice emergence profile. And that's a six millimeter diameter with a five millimeter height. Okay, and you can see, I also had to adjust the bone to be able to see what? The healing abutment. We all know the healing abutment is the tough part to seat, especially with these wider bodied healing abutments, which is great because you can shape the tissue. But if you're not accounting for that and you're not making room for it and your healing abutment doesn't seat, then you're just waiting for something to happen. Why? Why are you doing this to yourself? That's the question you need to ask yourself. When you know that there's going to be a problem, why are you allowing it to happen? And then putting yourself through stress later on. I don't get it. Okay, I see it all the time. Okay, and the key with the highest abundance, again, if you look carefully, you'll see this angry face, so two eyes, angry, and then the mouth. That's kind of what you're looking for. You're also looking for that radio opacity right at the top to ensure that it's seated. And I'll tell you, you should know if it's seated. When you're tightening it down, if you have to really push down, it's not seated. There's bone in the way. Okay, and we'll talk about that as well. So here is the emergence profile. That's about a five millimeter tissue height. And then there's the final crown. Again, there's no gaps. There's no interproximal areas where there's food impaction. Um, again, I don't see the need to do all these crazy cervical abutments and all this stuff when you can use stock and achieve, as long as you have a good depth on your implant, the same results, okay? So, um, with that said, uh, I wanted to just get into our topic, obviously, for today, which is treatment planning. And, I, and I'm, again, I hope some of those cases were really a prelude into what we're going to talk about today. Because many of you are going to say, well, Dr. Shake's going to talk about, okay, take a medical, do this. No, 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 no. You know me, man. We always got to make things a little bit interesting for you guys. I'm going to talk about real treatment planning. What do I mean by real treatment planning? The stuff you know you know, okay? It's the stuff that you don't know. You think you know, but you don't know what you don't know. Did I say no too many times? I did. You don't know what you don't know, okay? And that's what I'm getting to. So how do we get a patient who presents like this, who says, listen, Dr. Sheikh, I'm missing teeth. I, you know, I need teeth. I want a full smile. I don't want bridge work. I can't tolerate a partial and I wanna get chewing function again, okay? Where do we go from here, right? Where do you start off, right? Patient needs quad, quad implants, you know, how's the perio? There's so much, it becomes so overwhelming, you know? So it starts with a sound treatment plan, right? And figuring out where, what are we gonna do? What's salvageable, what's not salvageable? What is the patient gonna to commit to? What is their budget? What can we achieve for the patient realistically? And how are we going to improve their function and support? So this was after all of that said and done. Okay, this is the treatment plan that was developed. And I'm going to again take you through this. Not this case example, but how to do this. And this was, this was all done guided. So these are the implants that were placed guided. Okay. And then this is the soft tissue four months later. So how do we go from an initial stage with a patient to then a treatment planning stage where we're determining what we want to do for the patient. And then of course the execution, the execution, I'm not going to talk a lot about today. Okay. It's not a surgical, it's more about treatment planning and how do we get the patient 
to a sound treatment plan that you feel comfortable, the patient feels comfortable, and that's sound. That's what we're talking about today. But first, we need to do one thing. So, it's a little hard because I can't see anybody here. But I need you guys to close your eyes right now. Let me see if I can see you guys, man. See if I can see some of you guys. Okay, so, can't see anybody's video right now, but do me a favor, please, okay? Just close your eyes right now, right? Close your eyes. Everybody's eyes closed? Close your eyes. Picture this, okay? Picture this. You are currently right now with somebody who you love, okay? That person has done everything for you, has supported you in tough times, has guided you when you need guidance, has been there for you when you've been at your low. Who is that person? You know, who's that person? Can you guys type that into the chat box? I want to know who that person is for you. Okay. Who's that person who you just love, who you would just really, um, you know, hate. And I'll type mine in, you know, who you'd really hate to see something bad happen to, you know, who is that person? Okay. So we got our wife, we've got, um, you know, we've got, uh, David Chong Yen, <laughs> of course, Bob, his accountant, your mom, girlfriend, your wife, who is that person for you? Okay, your husband, all right? So keep your eyes closed. Remember, this is the person that you love. This is the person that has done everything for you, me, <laughs> okay? So imagine that person is currently right now in your chair, okay? That person's in your chair, and that person is looking up with you, those same eyes that they've used to cry for you and help you through your pain and your tears. Now they're looking up at you saying, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you with my mouth, with, with you know, the ability, my oral health. You're gonna be performing surgery on me, okay? You're gonna be invading my body, right? Like doing something not in like invasive. Wouldn't you think that that comes with a large amount of responsibility, right? That comes with a huge weight. Every single time you perform any treatment, especially surgical, you should feel that weight on your shoulders. You should feel that trust that that patient is putting on you. And you should take that trust and hold on to it because I can tell you right now, it's an honor, it's a privilege, and it comes with a huge amount of responsibility. And when you truly look at it from that perspective, treatment planning becomes really easy. Because then, and only then, you can then move forward to determine what is gonna be best. And it may not be you doing the treatment, it may be somebody else doing the treatment. But whatever that means, it may not be what's covered by the insurance, right? That's how you have to start your treatment planning. That's how I start every single case. That's how I decline cases. If I don't feel like I can live up to that patient's expectations or that trust, it's the patients that come in, I'm telling you, I don't know, you guys probably have this too, where a patient comes to you and just says, listen, I don't really care. Just do whatever you think is best. Have you had that? Have you guys had that patient come to you and just say that? I can tell you right now. Those are the hardest patients. I lose sleep over those patients because those are the ones, the ones that are assholes, like the one I saw today, you know, I don't, I mean, I still care. Don't get me wrong. I still, there's still responsibility, but you don't feel that weight. So that's how you need to start off every single case. You have a case going right now, close your eyes, pretend this was that person for you. This is the treatment plan that you came up with. And this is the trust and responsibility you've been in, 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 you know, entrusted with. So remember, trusting you is their decision. They've made that decision. Now it's for you. It's on you to prove that they made the right choice. Okay? You don't want your patient going through infection and pain and swelling. You wouldn't want that to happen to the person you love, right? Correct? So you better be damn sure 90%, 99% okay, that you can provide this patient with a good result. Otherwise, reconsider, because that's what you would do for the person you love, okay? So this is Denise, okay? She was one of those patients.
who just looked up at me and said, listen, Dr. Shake, I'm going to give you $100 every month for 15 months until I can pay the deposit. I know I need this tooth removed. It's hurting. It's swollen. Do whatever you think I should do for the best, right? And I did an immediate molar for her. And with that came a large amount of trust, right? Because I'm doing an immediate molar. She's entrusting me with her mouth, doing a surgery, not having it fail, infection, pain, swelling. She's paying $100 out a month, this lovely lady, right? Like to, to just put a layaway plan for an implant. So this is what we did for her, okay? And that's, that's her final crown. And now she's doing the same thing for her lower right. She's missing a four six. So I cannot stress this enough. And for those of you who are actually listening, this will help you guide your treatment planning because it does for me every day, all right? So this is another patient, Malgorzada. Her teeth are falling apart, her lower arch. She can't afford to do both arches in one year. She's gonna do the lower next year. She just looked up at me and she said, Dr. Shane, just do whatever you think is best. And I said, listen, I'm gonna do six implants. And that's what I, I'm gonna spread them out as much as I can. That's what I would do if you were my mom. I would get as many implants as possible. We did some crestal sinus lifting. We gave her some great AP spread. And now she's gonna do the lower next year. So here's Goldeer. I have a wedding, okay? I'm getting married next year, which was in three months. And I need to have a tooth. So we couldn't even do his final tooth. Here's the lateral. He's trusting me with his smile for his wedding. Like that's priceless, right? So I took out the tooth, I placed the implant, I made him a temporary crown and he was over the moon. But it came with a large amount of trust that I was gonna be able to deliver him that result because he didn't want indenture. So can you perform this treatment, right? And then there's the four month post-op with the soft tissue and the implant. These are the considerations that you have to think about when you're treatment planning a case. Second point, stop comparing yourself to others. Okay, this is huge. I, I cannot stress this enough because early in my career, this is what was my Achilles heel. I'd be like, listen, that guy's doing that. I should be able to do that. Or that guy has that. Why does he have that? I should have that. When now with social media, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, oh my God. You know, you see these cases and then I see these doctors are like, um, I wanna do this case. I'm like, bro, listen, you don't have to. You don't have to, or comparing yourself. First of all, comparing yourself to others, right? So what if Dr. Amin Shivji has 400 practices? Or you know, some of our colleagues here have 12, 15 practices. I've got one practice. So what if Dr. Sheikh is doing, you gotta stop comparing yourself to others when it comes to where you're at from a status perspective, from how many offices or how many patient flows or how much you're billing, it's got to stop because I can tell you when you're treatment planning based on what other people are doing because you want to keep up or you want to try to produce or you want to showcase what a cool case that you think you can do, it's not going to be worth it. I can tell you, I know, I've learned from experience. Listen, guys, it takes time. It takes skill. When you treatment plan, Treatment plan the cases you're confident doing. Don't go based on what this doctor or that doctor, the suit, this is what they're doing. So I can tell you, it's just gonna lead to heartache and headache. And it's gonna end up with you being disappointed, you losing trust and confidence, okay? So we have to remember that people who can't stand to see the success of others will never experience their own. And I know I've seen it. I've seen it happen to doctors in our club, in fact who just are like, well, this guy should, well, I wish this was doing this and he's doing that, I need to do that, or she's doing that, okay? It's about being content. When you come and you treatment plan from a place where you're content, it doesn't mean that you're desiring more, okay? It doesn't mean, by being content, doesn't mean you don't desire more. You can totally desire more. But you just need to be thankful for what you have. And it's gonna come, it's gonna come. It may not come this, this year, may not come next year, but I can already name a few study club members who were content and wanted and desired more and were thankful for what they had and are doing amazing things right now with implants, with their practice, whatever. Okay. And remember, it can always be worse. Sorry, Dr. Zhu. 
You could have an outbreak in your office right now and be closed. You could be part of the top five, 10% of earners and be making 70,000 after uh, pre tax, uh, post tax. I'm sure most of us are making more than that. We're in the top 5% of Canada earners. So remember when you're treatment planning, don't treatment plan, plan from a place of, yes, I have this case. This is what I'm going to do because I have this case. And this is the only case I have. And I need this because this is what I need to do because of production or whatever. Okay. Treatment plan from a place of being content with what you have and remembering who you love. And that's what you would want to do for that person. Okay. When it comes to case selection, don't bite off more than you can chew. Okay. It's super important to not do that because it's going to bite you in the ass. All right. So I will stress, and we talked to this about the basic implant training program, look at the case, review the appendix in the guidelines and classify the case and where your skill level is at. So if you perceive the case as being easy, you can visualize the end, the tube position is the same, the implant surgery, there's no anatomy, we need to worry about the soft tissue is perfect, occlusion is fine, aesthetics, the patient doesn't care, God bless you, go for it. But if you're getting into the more complex cases, you need to know how to manage those cases. And more importantly, manage the complications that number one will arise during surgery, and number two will arise post-surgery, that could arise post-surgery, right? You also need to classify your patient as far as their medical status. That's super important. When it comes to treatment planning, you can use this sheet. And I tell all the basic implant training program students that have run through the program, print this out for each patient and just circle and circle. That means you've done some due diligence with reviewing these, right? Also in the guidelines, and it's a 16 page document, it has checklists. That you, can satisfy, that you can satisfy yourself in the college. So this is the pre-surgical checklist. Print it out. Check it. Whatever applies. If you miss something, then get it done. Here is the surgical checklist. When you're performing surgery, go through that and get it done. Here is the post-surgical checklist, the confirmation of osseointegration, and the long-term and follow-up and maintenance. Those three sheets, you can have that for one patient per patient. And it'll guide you to make sure you didn't miss anything because it's very comprehensive, okay? But with treatment planning, this is really where you should start. You should have this for each case, all right? And as a result, you classify your case, right? So cases are not all the same. There's an easy case and an easy patient, right? Easy case, easy patient, chill patient. There's an easy case, but a pain in the ass patient, okay? You, there's also a hard case, but an easy patient, okay? But then you got the worst of all, which is the hard case and the hard patient. Green, stick to the green depending on your confidence. Now you're venturing into yellow here with the harder patient, right? Higher expectations, may not show up for post-ops, doesn't wanna pay anything for the treatment, dictating treatment, I just had that today. Okay, um, hard case, hard, a hard case, easy patient, again, in the yellow zone. And now the worst of all, which I saw the last patient for today, honestly, I wanted to pull up my hair, whatever hair I had left. This guy literally tested my last nerve, tested my last nerve. I actually told him to leave my office. Okay, and he still wouldn't leave, right? It's an all-on case, but anyways. So here's an example, but you need to set the bar low. So always set the bar so low that it's very easy to meet your goal and exceed it when it comes to treatment planning. Remember this, all right? So here's Lily, lovely lady, wonderful personality. Oh, I trust you, good amount of bone, you know, easy case, easy patient, all right? There's the, there's the end result. Marcello, looks like a lot of bone, right? Good bone, maybe a little bit softer inside. You can see the difference of the cortical layer and the trabecular bone. So maybe that we might under prep this implant. Um, pain in the ass patient. I had to sedate him to do these implants. Um, it was a pain taking the healing abutments off. 
just taking the healing above it. Oh, oh God. And then I took an impression and he's like in pain for like six weeks. And his wife calls who babies him and makes his lunch every day and wants to know how he's going to eat because he just had an impression. <laughs> oh my God. Anyways, that's Marcello. Okay. Thank God. This is his case at the end, but easy case, hard ass patient charge more for those patients. Okay. Here's a harder case, full mouth, crown or bridge is failing, but a beautiful patient, chill patient, you know, was okay, do whatever you need. I trust you. I'm going to come at the post-op visits. You know, I'm going to eat soft foods. Okay, so there's her final. Now we have Maggie here. You guys have seen this case before. Honestly, I just get upset when I see this. You see her case. She's just difficult, man. She's a hygienist with a high smile line, wants the world, okay, has resorption on a central that affects the lateral. And now we have to put an implant in there the same day, make it temporary, regrow bone, all this stuff. And guess what? She doesn't like her final crown. Okay, even though we went through like three custom shades. It's a hard case and a hard patient, man. Stay away. All right, guys, don't even send me those cases, honestly. I don't want to deal with those. All right, I'm losing. I've already lost so much hair. All right. So this is kind of a case I get from a doctor saying, I want to do this case. Tell me how to do it. I'm like, bro. Broski, right? The tooth is moving. There's zero bone here. What the hell are you going to do? This is your fifth implant. And you want to make a tooth the same day? But Dr. Sheikh, I saw this case on Facebook that you did where Isabel came in and there was a big hole in the bone. And you went through the treatment planning with her. And no matter what, she still wanted one implant. And it was so easy. You just did a phrenectomy. You thin the tissue with a super small blade. You expose the bone. You prep the implant. You made a tooth. Look, the temporary cylinder fits no problem. And then you just made a tooth for her and you grafted it. Okay, and there's the two-week post-op I saw. And then here's the final. I can tell you right now, that was not easy. That was a high-risk case. Super difficult. That should not have been done to begin with. With three informed consents, specifically written for the patient. I had to call the referring dentist as well because he thought I was crazy and almost stopped referring me cases, quite honestly. This was a huge risk. Don't take those risks. It's not worth it. I will take those risks because I know what I feel comfortable doing. You have to gauge the case according to what you get. Just because he got this case, I know you want to do it, but I get this all the time. Doctor, I hope you're doing well. I've attached a file regarding the 2-4. Do you think I can do this case? <laughs> okay, this is the question I get all the time. Seems like I have to do a massive bone graft on the buccal side. The extraction was done last year at another dental office. Please guide me. Thank you. I'm going to say I get this question four to five times a week. A week. Okay? So I tell the doctor, no problem. Here's a similar case. No buckle bone. This is what you're going to encounter. This is how you can put the implant in. This is what it has to look like when it's done. And if I took a CT of your case, that's what it should look like. So then he's like, oh. And I said, well, he's like, well, can I do this case? Bro, I don't know. Can you? Like, don't ask me. <laughs> you tell me. Do you have the skill, the confidence? the experience to do a case like that? You tell me, don't ask me, because I'm not gonna be in your office doing it, and I'm sure as hell not gonna give you permission to do the case, if that's what you're looking for. You need to figure out if you can do the case. So hopefully the 46 people watching now is, I'm absolutely here to help guide you. Of course, that's the purpose of the study club. But if you're gonna ask me a question on if you can do the case, just, Delete that sentence because I don't know. You tell me. Okay, you tell me because I'm not going to be responsible for it. You are. Okay? So you have to really look at the scale. And the scale for treatment planning is simple. There's confidence. Yes, you want to push your skill. Yes, you want to be able to do things. But if you haven't raised flaps, then no, you can't do a case like that. Are you uncertain? If you're uncertain, don't do the case. Or do it under mentorship. Are you confident? And then there's egotistical. They're just like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to do the all on, man. It's an all on, man. I did an all on. 
you know, I did it this and that. I tell you, man, you're going to get yourself in problems. And more importantly, the person who you love who's sitting in that chair, the one who you closed your eyes and you thought, wow, I would never harm them ever. I would only want the best for them is the one who's going to suffer. Okay. And listen, I'm not saying there's complications, but if you're not confident about a case, don't take it on. Okay. But if you're uncertain, then ask, that's what we're here for. And I'm here to help you grow your confidence as are all the other members through mentorship programs or observing or whatever that may be. Okay. So here's another question I got for a mentorship case. Doctor sent me this case saying, I would like to do this under mentorship. <laughs> I said, really? Well, if you look very clearly, there is a huge ass bowl hole on the buckle of this premolar. Okay. There's a big hole. So the question is, yeah, you can do the case, but if it's a mentorship case through the high lesson program, you better be damn sure you can do 80% of this. Do you know how to split a flap? Do you know how to do a split thickness flap? Do you know how to debride the site? Can you get stability in this area when there's a big hole? How are you going to flap it? Do you know how to suture? How are you going to graft? Are you going to do PRF? How are you going to stabilize the bone? How are you going to stabilize the implant? You know, if it's a one-on-one -on -one mentorship, I have no problem. I can jump in. But on a mentorship program with high Austin where there's four or five doctors oper or four doctors operating at the same time, you got to be able to do 20% of the case on your own. Or sorry, 80% of the case on your own, right? I can't be doing the whole case. And I don't want to. That, there's no, that's not the purpose of learning, right? Otherwise, just come and watch me do it. So you have to ask yourself, can you do this case confidently? If you can't, a one-on-one -on -one mentorship, I'd be happy to see you in the office and we can do this one-on-one. -on -one. And that way I'm with you only and I can help you out through the case and guide you, okay? What about here, a case, right? We saw this and this was a great example, right? Patient has perio, you know, and I see these kind of cases all the time, perio, a crossbite, right? That's the perio is not stable. Look at the three, seven. I mean, the patient is going to want the world, but what are you prepared to do before you get into a case like this? Clearly there needs to be a discussion with the patient on treatment planning, on taking diagnostic models, doing an overall wax up, looking at the patient's budget, looking at their perio status, right? How's their occlusion going to be if you're going to restore the implant bridge in this one, one to two, two area? You have to look at these things before you go and jump into a case. And I know most of you do, but I want to reiterate that, that these cases are not easy. And this person who loves you is trusting you to be able to deliver a good result for them, right? An ideal or an excellent result for them. So this is what happens. And I know some of you have been there already. I know because I get the calls during the day. I get the FaceTime messages. I get the texts. I get the WhatsApp. All right. I love all of you guys and I want to see and girls and I want to see all of you succeed. I don't want to see any of you guys get discouraged in what you're doing, but I would hate to see you do a case and then you lose sleep over it because you will lose sleep. Trust me. I know I've been there and I'm having, want to have you guys avoid that losing sleep over an implant case or any type of surgical case, unlike a filling or a veneer or something like that. Okay. You know what? These things are not surgical. There's not pain normally involved. Um, you know, or severe repercussions, as the RCDSO says when it comes to PLP and malpractice, implant surgery has higher repercussions, has higher deleterious effects. So you have to be aware of this, okay? So you need to perform a comprehensive assessment when it comes to treatment planning, right? We need to make sure we listen to the patient. So listen to them. What do they want? Are they looking for function? Are they looking for aesthetics? And how are you going to help them get that? So what is their chief complaint? What is their dental history? I want to know when was the last time they saw the dentist? How often are they going for cleaning? And when I look inside, is there perio? Is there caries? Right? I mean, you need to address these things. And what about the wear? I mean, if we do implants on this patient, the same implants are going to be subjected to the same thing. I just told a patient yesterday, I said, listen, God gave you your teeth for free. Okay? He gave you your teeth for free. You lost some. No problem. They were free. Are you going to be pissed off if you lose $15,000 worth of teeth that I give you? Because those weren't free. He's like, well, yeah, I'd kind of be pissed off. Okay, well, then you screwed up your regular teeth, which I can tell you God does a way better job than we do. All right? And now you're going to screw up the implant work if you don't change something when it comes to perio 
or wear or your frequency of hygiene or whatever, because otherwise I can't help you straight up. And trust me when I tell you patients will appreciate your honesty. Some of them will leave, but trust me, it's okay. If they really like you and you, and, and you really stick to your values, they'll come back. What's their medical history like? You need to get a full list of their medications. In fact, now we're actually requesting the full list of medications from their pharmacy. So they get a full printout of the last year so we can see if there's any variations or anything like that. Any allergies, of course. And then any, every software system, because we just had a doctor who prescribed an, uh, amoxicillin to a patient who was allergic because it wasn't put in the system and ended up in the hospital. Okay, one of our members. So allergies, put it in your software so that it pops up. You can pop up and it pops up the allergy. Okay, and then of course smoking, right? We need to know these things. Your extra oil, get them to give you a big smile line. If you're doing a full arch case, you want to know where is the tissue, right? If you're doing a single tooth, how picky are they going to be, right? What does their smile line look like? Is there any asymmetry? And you need to check their vertical dimension as well, right? For these for, for full arch cases, even, even single teeth. You want to know what is the restorative height that you're going to have for the crown. Do you need to place the implant deeper because there's not enough room? You need to look at the teeth. And you need to look at the tissue. So quite frankly, I look at the soft tissue before I looked at the bone. And I would recommend for every single one of your cases getting good intro photos or digital photos to be able to assess the tissues and show your patient what they look like also. It also can show them plaque and occlusion. You have a patient coming in today who was saying, oh, you know, my tooth feels loose on the bottom. I'm convinced something's loose on the bottom. And right above it, he's got a crossbite. I said, well, it's your occlusion. You need ortho to correct this problem because there's an ortho problem. I took a picture, but he didn't get it until I showed him the picture. Digital photos, extra and intro you need to show. And then of course, 2D x-rays is where we start. And then of course, we need a CT. It's not, a, it's not an option, it's a requirement before we do any implant surgery. So this is Chung, was referred to me. He said, you know what? Um, so we took a CT scan. You can see basically he's got endotreated teeth on the 3-2 and 3-1. The 3-1 had uh, apical lesion and it was spreading to the 3-2. There was bone loss around the end recession, around the 4-1 and the 4-2 with stage one to two mobility. But the patient said, listen, I don't want to take out my two teeth on the right side. I just want you to take out the one tooth, which is the crown. I said, listen, I understand that, but you have gum disease everywhere. You have lost bone everywhere. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna place an implant here, just like I told Isabel, and that bacteria is gonna go and affect these implants. So after we treatment planned his case, I took some pictures to show him the recession and the discoloration, and we showed him some before and after of some options. We winded up doing comprehensive care, which was removing the four anteriors and placing implants and restoring it. And in fact, last year we had a member who listened to the patient and did two implants, and those two implants failed because, and one of you may know who she is, she's not a member anymore, but she showed me the case um, and uh, the implants failed because she opted not to deal with the other two periodontally involved teeth, right? So you have to dictate the treatment, but it starts with showing and educating the patient, right? And I can tell you guys right now, patients, will demand and demand and demand. And I was one of the patients I had today, the guy literally was just saying, I wanna keep these three teeth. I said, listen, I want a Ferrari, help me out, brother. Like, you help me, I help you, right? Patients are gonna cry and complain that they want more and more and more, okay? And they're gonna bully you, you know? And, 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 and I find it, I'm not stereotyping, but you know, some, Men and women both are more are susceptible to feeling guilty, right? We're feeling guilty that, oh, we want to help the patient. Or, oh, you know what? I really want to do this for the patient. I didn't, you did not brush their teeth for 10 years, right? You can't let patients bully you and push you into treatment that you don't feel comfortable performing. Because I can tell you, when shit hits the fan, they're going to forget about all you being nice, and now they're going to want their money back or they're gonna want you to pay for something that went wrong. So don't let patients dictate treatment, okay? So here's an example. I did socket preservation in early July. I know I should wait four months, but the patient really wants it placed before November. Is three months okay or should I wait until November? 
Normally I'd wait four months, but this guy's in a rush. And listen, guys, patients are great at saying, and I'll tell you, it happens all the time. You do the surgery, you see them back two weeks later, everything's fine. They come back after a month and a half, the month and a half, their six week visit. And they're like, oh, so when are we, when are we uh, doing the final crown? We're like, well, you know, uh, Jim, we told you that everything takes four months for it to heal. You're like, well, I don't remember you telling me four months. Four months? What are you talking about four months? I thought we'd be done by like Christmas time. Get that stuff in writing, okay? Because patients are gonna magically, for conveniently forget, right? It's selective amnesia all of a sudden that they tend to forget what you said. So don't let patients, so I, I, I typed back to this doctor, I said, no, you gotta wait four months. Why, well, that's fine, you know, you gotta do it. What about here, a case that was sent to me for mentorship? Just recently, I'm just showing you guys recent stuff. I get hundreds of cases, guys. I'm just showing you some of the stuff that hopefully is gonna help with the treatment planning stuff. But here's a case, I wanna do the implant for the one one as a mentorship case. There seems like there's adequate bone. I want to make a tooth the same day. WTF. <laughs> I look at the scan and I can see it a little bit on the 1-1, one, one, but you know, I'm looking at cases all the time. I'm looking at this lesion on the 2-1 and here's the 2-1. I go, please send me the CT scan. She sends me the CT scan. Okay, she only sent me the first page, this, this screenshot, this one. And the 2-1 has a massive lesion with perio. I'm like, what is going on here? Are we dentists? Like, are we not healthcare providers? Are we just losing our mind when it comes to treatment planning? Because last I checked, there's a 2-1 here that needs to be dealt with way before the implant. But guess what? The patient wants an implant. Okay? The patient wants the implant. You guys have heard me say this analogy before, and I use it on this patient today. You build me a ship. So this is what I said to this guy, Michael, today. Full arch. He's got perio. He's like, I want to keep three teeth. I want you to do an upper all on, and I want nine implants, even though he's got no bone in his sinuses. Like, sinuses are completely pneumatized. I go, listen, Michael, you're an engineer, right? Yes, I engineer. He's, he's Asian, right? Yes, I engineer. I said, fine. This is the deal. You build me a ship. Okay, because people have built ships, right? We've gone to the moon before, right? It's been done. You build me a ship. You take me to the moon. When we get back, I'll do your nine implants and I'll add bone. No problem. And he's like, no, 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 but I want to keep these three T. I said, no, 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 you build me a ship. And I kept saying that for five minutes. You I kept saying that. And he still didn't get it, this guy. Just didn't get it. But you take me to the moon. You bring me back and we'll do this. And that's how I would approach your patients. There's things that are just not possible and they're just wrong to do like that, okay? You have to do no harm, like medical profession, dental profession. You can't place an implant knowing, knowing that that perio is gonna affect the other, the new implant that you, but you're gonna flap that or you're gonna get in that site, right? Just don't let patients bully you around when it comes to treatment planning. Okay, I can't stress that enough. So this is Ty. He bullied some poor doctor into doing three implants in his upper arch for a full upper denture, okay? And the guy had no bone. So what happened? He placed three implants. You can see the middle one here. And then here's another one that just fell out. And then two of the three implants fell out and the other one was loose. And now he's like, well, you know, I told the dentist that I needed to do three implants, but I'm thinking like dentist, you know a minimum number of implants for an upper arch is four. You know you need to get a good AP spread and there's not enough bone. So you know you need to add bone. So unfortunately this patient presented to me with another, with the remaining loose implant on the upper and an oral antral communication between the soft tissue and the sinus in the two, three site. So now what? Now I tell Ty, I say, listen, you need an oral antral closure, so I have to open up the sinus. You need to do sinus lifting, bone grafting. There might be some residual bone to place implants the same day. I need to do six implants because I'm going to use shorter implants. And that's what I want to do. And I, and I said, listen, give me 15 grand. And he goes, no, I only want three implants. I said, no problem. Go somewhere else. I can't help you. 
I can't help you. I'm not going to be the guy who's going to screw, whose stuff's going to be screwed at, and then you're going to want your money back. So he left. He came back six months later. He had the treatment done. Okay, this was the treatment plan, and this is what we actually did. You can see some lateral sinus lifting, and I did wind up repairing the sinus as well, and we gave him good AP spread. In fact, one of the key points with treatment planning is over-engineering. We're going to talk about that. But in a case like this, where the patients had failures, I put two, four, six, seven implants, not six, because he paid for six. I will often place additional implants on patients that are pain in the asses, because I'd rather have an implant fail down the road and just uncover an extra one, than go back in surgically and do something. So, and even for nice patients, I'll do that. Or for areas where the implant isn't as stable, I'll put another one in an area so that at least we'll have a backup. The implant costs 140 bucks. I mean, I get them for a better price than that even. So, and it takes an extra five, seven minutes to do, right? So why not? This is Wayne. I said, Wayne, you got no back teeth. Okay, his front bridge was completely failed. So he had on the upper left, he had chrysalis. They did a bridge for him about, I don't remember how many years ago, maybe ten, seven years ago. I wound up doing the upper right bridge because his, his, um, his uh, teeth had failed. And he came back to me for his anterior bridge that had failed. They did endos, they did crowns. Um, not the greatest dentistry in the world, I can tell you. Um, but it lasted him for about nine months. And then this whole thing fell apart. And I said, listen, are we going to do implants in the posterior? Because we need some posterior implants. He's like, I'm not ready for that. My front teeth are falling apart. I'm financially constrained. I just did this implant bridge. I said, fine. I want to do one implant per tooth. Okay, I don't want to do an implant bridge. I want to do one implant per tooth to support your bite. Because I don't know when the hell you're going to do get posteriors. And right now, your back teeth, your front teeth are acting as your back teeth. And God didn't make them want to do that. And that's why things are failing. So he agreed. So we did three, one, three immediate implants. He had had a buckle bone loss on one of those areas, which I grafted as well. And he has one implant per tooth. And I might even splint those all together. Because look at the wear. You can see the wear on his lower teeth. So I dictate the treatment. Of course, we give them options. And of course, there's an informed consent. But I right off the bat tell them, this is what I want to do. Because this is what you need to do. You're not going to tell me what to do. OK? You also, part of treatment planning, have to manage expectations, okay? So what are their expectations? Do they want to be able to eat right away? Do they want things to last forever? Do they want a, a maintenance-free <laughs> approach, right? Like no maintenance. I want this done and I never want to come back, right? Those are all, these are all kind of like, you know, they're, these are all red flags, in my opinion, right? Will they commit? Are they going to sign an informed consent? And on every informed consent sheet that you have, you should have just like an extra space on the bottom. Something that's just blank and open that you can actually write certain things in specific to that case. And so they read the standard consent form for implants and bone grafting and all that stuff. And at the bottom of it, you can write in, advise patient. I mean, all my consent forms say you need to go for three to four month cleanings. You need to wear your night guard. But it may say, patient aware, high risk of temporary crown coming loose, right? Because a patient may not listen to you not chewing on their immediate anterior, right? And causing failure, right? So whatever specific things to that case, write it on there from consent and get them to sign it so they're committing to that. Also intervals, you need to tell them, you need to see them back for the appropriate intervals, right? You should see a patient within a week to two weeks, maximum right? And then the frequent intervals as well. Also, costs. You need to get that in writing. And I can tell you, I've been burned myself in my practice saying, oh, we, you know, we didn't have this, just so much paperwork moving around that nobody knows what the hell's going on. And the patient says, no, I was supposed to pay this much. And we said, no, we we're supposed to pay this much. And now those two don't match. And trust me, it happens. Night guards, maintenance, are they going to commit? And have you told the patient about what these are going to cost as well, right at the beginning, right? So patient spends 50 grand. Now you tell them they need to come in for four or $500 maintenance appointments, you know, and now they're like, what? I didn't know I needed the maintenance. Okay, or I didn't know I needed to commit to wearing a night guard. And you need to get them to sign that, okay? Also, managing your own expectations. Can you your surgical skill handle this case? Do you have a proper team that can help you with this case? We talked about a lab. 
if you're doing it all on a good denturist or somebody who can help you do conversion, um, who can share with you their experience and make things go efficiently well. You don't have the patient there all day doing it all on, right? Like, I mean, it happens, right? Bob shared a case with us. It was like a nine to five. He said the surgery went way great. And then the freaking conversion took like whatever, however many hours. Why? Shouldn't be like that, right? I could get a guy in your office do a conversion in less than an hour, right? Or an hour, hour and 15. So what's going on here, right? And then of course, patient factors. I don't mean only medical issues, right? Because medical is a concern, but length of appointment. How long is it going to take you this case? Is this patient going to be able to tolerate this length of appointment? Or are they going to be susceptible to more infection? Or are they going to listen to your post-op instructions? Are they going to smoke afterwards? Um, you know, are they going to start going and pulling on the cheek and taking selfies? Right? Like patient factors. There's always these patient factors <coughs> that we need to be aware or concerned about. So, the next part of treatment planning is, of course, comprehensive treatment planning. Many times with implants, we get so zoned in on one small little area that you miss all the grenades that are being thrown at you from abroad, right? So you have to really look at the big picture. So this was a good example of a case. One of our study club members had presented this case and said, hey, you know what? The patient has failing molars. Okay, so there's some molars that are failing here in the posterior quite a bit of bone loss, so obviously the patient has perio. There's also severe perio in the anterior, okay? So the canines have some moderate bone loss, but the patient's missing pretty much needs extractions of the one, two, the one, one, the two, one, missing the two, two, or sorry, the two, two is present, um, but there's three teeth need to come out. So, you know, where do we start with a case like this, you know? And, you know, the first place that I would start is obviously assessing the perio, which the doctor did, the patient wants a bridge in the anterior because there's clearly not a lot of bone. So she may be making an anterior bridge from the canine, maybe double abutting to the lateral and the canine. Um, and that's, I said, that's fine because, you know, she reviewed the implant options with vertical bone augmentation and this and that. But now when it comes to the posterior, you know, do we start on the lower right? Because the patient really wants some teeth on the lower right because maybe he thinks he's going to be functioning with this molar. Okay. So, he wants to proceed with a bridge. He wants to do implants in the lower right and the upper left. Initially, I thought I would do the lower right, but looking at the bone available, it might just be good to do two implants in that area instead of an implant bridge. He's not ready for the upper left, and he wants to proceed with that next year. So what I advise this doctor is I said, you know, what do you want to do? Because I hear a lot about what the patient wants to do, okay? Because he's not ready, and he wants. But I want to know, what do you want to do? What is your treatment plan? And she said, well, it's a bit confusing because there's a lot of stuff going on. And I said, well, listen, the anterior is obviously a concern. His perio is a concern. Let's get the perio up to, up, up to speed and let's, you know, do the anterior if that's the concern. As far as the posterior, if we do the lower right, it's going to be functioning with nothing on the upper left. He still has a pretty decent 3.6. And again, once this is mounted, I don't know whether the 3.7 can be salvaged or you know, adjusted or maybe a crown to reduce the occlusion. But if you do the implants on the upper left first, at least he'll be functioning more on the upper left as opposed to the implants on the lower right. Of course, the case has to be mounted. So that's what I advised. I said, listen, here's the CT scan. Yes, there's bone everywhere. So the upper right, this is the upper right. It shows on the upper right. Um, that there is some pretty decent usable bone, eight to eight and a half millimeters in the molar area. Now we've got the upper left area, the 2627, which has got a pretty decent amount of bone. And again, I advise the doctor, look at the quality of the bone. Is the, is the, is the sinus floor corticated? You know, is it, is, or is there a huge differentiation between the cortical bone and the trabecular bone? Because that'll give you a guide as to how dense the bone is when you're preparing the site. This is the lower right. So again, you can see the lower right in the four, six and the four, seven, here's the four, five, here's the four, six, pretty decent bone in the four, six and four, seven sites. So I mentioned, and she already knew this, take digital photos, you know, do take some uh, good intro photos, assess the smile line, the occlusion and work with the lab. That's what I told her. I said, wax up the case, the anterior bridge, 
and, and, and get a feel for what things are going to look like so you can sew the patient. So I advised her, I said, you know, anterior, that's his primary concern after the perio is under control. Then we would do, I would actually recommend doing the upper left, right? Just to give him better function because he's got teeth down there. And if the three seven's got to go, maybe just, you know, one implant for the three six. And then focus on the right side. Because when the right side, if you're committing to do the lower right, you're really committing to doing something on the upper right. Because otherwise the patient's not going to have any function. Okay, so that's kind of my thought process. I know many of you may have other, um, you know, treatment plans. Um, so, yeah, okay. And so I just wanted to make sure, yep, no questions. So we're good. So this is another case. And Bob was kind enough to share this case with us. Um, with a case that he did, he extracted, he grafted, he placed some implants, guided, great positions. Um, but again, you can see there's still some periodontal disease and the patient didn't want to have it treated, right? Or maybe had it treated and wasn't stable. The teeth were not extracted. So bone looked pretty good at time of impression. Then what happened was if we look carefully, things are not seated. So we've got this final crown that's not fully seated of the bridge. There might be in some movement. As a result, potentially we're suspecting that there could have been some micro movement now causing bone loss and there's infection. So these are all wonderful cases for us to learn from, right? On what we should and shouldn't do. And initially when Bob sent us this, I only got really the PAs. Once I saw the big picture, you know, then I started thinking, okay, you know, could it have been perio related, right? Like there's periodontal disease in other areas. Could that have affected the implants? Who knows, right? So these are all really important things to consider from a comprehensive care standpoint. And I would tell the patient, you have decided that you want to do implants in this area and not treat the other areas that need to be treated. So that's what I write. You, the patient, has decided to go against my, the doctor who's gone to dental school, advice about treating these areas first you are aware that your implants may fail as a result of a compromised result and sign off on it. And I can tell you many patients will not sign off on that and they will start having the conversation with you because they then know you're serious. Okay. So patient education is super important, showing them the difference, showing them work that you've done. So I just use and try to keep it simple. So if you can show them the work that you've done, not many people want to see the cow before they eat the steak. You get what I mean? Right? They don't want to see that. They just want to know it's going to be medium rare and it's going to taste really good. Some patients want to see that, like the engineer did today. He wanted to see everything, right? So you can have some pictures, but you can have just some before -nurse. Here's a, a, a patient education material that I use, right? So here's teeth in a day. That's the gold standard. That's going to cost you $25,000 per arch. Here's a fixed removable option. So it's removable, but it's fixed. That's going to cost you 20,000 an arch. And here's a locator option, which is going to cost you about 14 to 15,000 per arch. That's it. It's as simple as that. What's your budget, right? And I'll tell you, patients will, you will be surprised like this guy. You will be surprised. Once you educate the patient and you stick to your values and you properly treatment plan, based on comprehensive care, right? So I told you that guy who was arguing with me today for the all on, do you know what he came in today for? Why he was here today? Not only for his final consult, he was in for a new patient exam, a full perio chart. I mean, we're taking out all his uppers, full perio chart, a full scaling and debridement with oral hygiene instructions for his lower arch and, or, and uh, again, the final consultation. So we wanted to assess his lower teeth, especially for sedating the patient, right? We don't want to sedate the patient, go ahead and do the upper arch only to find out he needed three teeth removed on the lower. I mean, that would really suck, right? Now we got to sedate them again, right? Because they have this fear or anxiety. So, um, so your patients will surprise you once you tell them. And they will pay, okay? They will pay for your treatments. Don't think they won't. But also don't let that drive your treatment, okay? Don't let that drive you saying yes to a case just because they said yes and they're willing to pay. It comes with a huge amount of responsibility and trust on you to do these. But whenever I end off a case presentation, I always say, listen, this is gonna come down to number one, what do you want? 
and what you can afford. And if I did my job right and showed them what they want based on value, creating the value, right? So having teeth that don't move the same day or you know, being able to place an implant the same day or being able to now chew because you will have a tooth there as opposed to you only being able to chew on one side, then they will pay. You also got to find out what their budget is. So when I get referrals, you know, I used to have a referral, a doctor who I met early on in my career who just said, I'm going to send you a ton of cases. And I'm like, oh, that's great. And every single case she sent me, the patient was like $3,500 for an implant? What? Like, well, are they not telling you general cost, like what an implant is? He's like, oh, I thought it was like 500 bucks. So you need to be fair with the patient and tell them, listen, what's your budget? Like, what's your budget here? And once you tell me what your budget is, then I can help you. But right now, I don't know what to, to do for you, right? So here's Ia, right? She had, her upper arch was toast. She needed all her upper teeth removed. And she's like, I want to do all on. I said, fine, it's 25,000. She's like, I don't have 25,000. I said, fine, do you have 22? She said, I could probably swing 22. I said, well, if you don't have IV sedation, okay, so it knocks off 1,500 bucks, and we don't do a conversion, which is $2,000, that saves you 3,500 bucks right there. She's like, cool, I'm in. So I took out her teeth, placed the implants, I buried them for the all on, she left with the denture, and then I uncovered them later on, four or five months later. This is what I call the delayed all on technique, right? And now the patient had teeth later on, and that's fine, you can do that, because she didn't want to pay for conversion and IV sedation. So here's Walter, he's like, you know what? I only want four implants to support my upper denture. I said, Walter, clearly you have broken teeth. You've broken implants, dude. Okay, whatever we need to give you on the top, if it's implants, we need to over-engineer the hell out of this stuff because you're going to break things. You're going to break your teeth. You're going to break the implants. You're going to break everything. You've broken implants, dude, right? So that's what we did. I gave him six implants, good AP spread, and, uh, and four is just not going to cut it for him, Okay. So those are the six, and now he's gonna go have an, a locator-supported denture is what he, he can afford, okay? Here's Caesar. Dr. Sheikh, I heard you can do immediate molars. Um, yeah, but I can't perform miracles. I can't walk on water here, Caesar. okay? You've got a big-ass hole in the bone, and the only way to do, do this properly is to graft this case, because it was so big, the nerve was there, so we grafted the case and there's nothing wrong with that. Graft the case, come back four months, five months later, and the bone, look at the bone. It's healed and now implants are a joke. I can put the implants in and now we let it heal for four months. Yes, it's gonna take four months longer, but we're gonna get a better result for the patient. And I'll tell you that I only do immediate implants if I feel I can deliver the same or better result doing an immediate approach compared to a delayed approach. Because that's what you gotta, Put yourself, that's a standard you have to hold yourself to, right? Remember, patients are gonna sit there and they're gonna start crying. And they're gonna say, oh, this is so expensive. And you know, I just broke up with my wife and I have four kids. And I'm like, listen, dude, I get it. You know what I mean? I get it. But unfortunately, I'm a professional. I'm not here to be your friend. I don't say that to them, but some of us wanna try to be their friend. And we wanna try to do these things. And the more you try to do these things, the more you forget that you need to be a professional. You need to be a professional, you need to give them sound professional advice, and you need to be there to guide them with a sound treatment plan. And not be their friend and not do bone grafting because that's what they need, but you wanna to try to help them out, okay? So there's a big difference here, and you can be friends later on. Trust me, they'll still be friends with you. All my patients are friends, all right, whatever. I'm the professional. That's what I'm trying to do is trying to help them with their issue, okay? Also, get everything in writing. I said that already. You need to stipulate things in writing. It needs to be a good informed consent with a special area where you can write things in that area, okay? When it comes to the financial, this is the way I do it in my office. I had like nine forms, guys. It's down to two. I have one estimate sheet. I told my treatment coordinator, my office manager, many of you have met her, Karen. I said, listen, Karen, I get it. There's all these cool things we can do. I don't give a shit, okay? All I want is an estimate sheet. That estimate sheet has to have a number at the bottom. 
of it. That estimate sheet needs to be signed by the patient. That same number needs to now be put onto the financial sheet. And that, those two numbers, if they don't match, somebody's getting get fired and it's not me. But those need to match. And once those match, then we're good. They've signed this, we have their credit card, we know the financial arrangement, the estimate tells us what we're doing, it, the financial tells us how they're gonna pay for it, that's it. That's all I want. Don't complicate things, guys. But you need to have this in writing because when the patient says, wait a minute, I didn't know, you told me you were gonna charge 3,000 or 2,800 an implant. You can see here, it's clearly written 3,150 per implant. Okay, this is a patient I've done like nine implants on, so I give him a break. Okay, if you do an implant bridge, the cost is 7,300, an extra thousand for a ponte. So everything is just clear, it's simple, but guess what? It is in writing, okay? You keep the master copy, you give them a copy and scan it in the chart, okay? And prepare to tell them that commitment is not just you talking, Mr. Jones, of you saying, yes, I'm gonna clean, and yes, I'm gonna do this stuff, and yes, I'm gonna wear the night guard, and yes, I'm gonna come back. It's an act, okay? Just like you're committing to them, to providing them a sound treatment plan, the patient needs to commit as well. So here's Patrick. I placed in implants on him eight and a half years ago. Okay, we did uh, four implants. Was it four? Yeah, we did four implants for his lower and um, he never came back. I didn't see him for four years. He came back after four years, he had some mild bone loss. We talked to him about again, hygiene and cleaning. He came, two visits for hygiene, and then he never showed up for another four years or three years. Now he shows up, he's like, oh, he brings three implants in his hand. And this is his other implant. And he's like, your implants failed. I said, oh, my implants failed. I said, well, here's your consent form that you signed. Can you just show me? I'm happy to redo this at no charge for you, Patrick. I'm happy to redo this whole thing. Um, I really apologize for what's happened. Um, I, I'm willing to do that. Um, you just show me your hygiene schedule. Like it says here, you were supposed to be going every three to four months because that's how you lost your teeth, right? It was from gum disease. So this is your consent form that you signed. Can you just show me proof that you've gone anywhere else for cleanings? And then I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, I have to recharge you for all of this stuff and it's going to cost more. Now, am I lying to the guy? No. So we redid this case and he paid for it without a question. And he signed another consent form because the guy could not manage his lower denture. So I over-engineered his case. I removed implants, I cleaned out the infected sites, I placed five or six implants for him, even though he paid for five, oh, sorry, he paid for four, I gave him two additional implants, and we're gonna uncover four of them, and when those fail, he'll have an additional two to go back to, and hopefully he'll be dead by then, okay? Because he's already pushing like, you know, 65, so I got, I'm hoping to get another like 10, 15 years for this guy, all right? I mean, maintenance, you gotta be, tell the patients, right? And you know, the first thing of course is we wanna blame ourselves. We wanna blame ourselves. Did we do the surgery? Did we take on the case properly? Did we, was it above our, was it within the confines of our surgical skill? But then blame the patient because oftentimes that's what it is, right? Okay? Part of treatment planning means you need a team approach, okay? When you start doing any type of uh, multiple case prosthetic, even single tooth, quite frankly, but especially the larger cases, you need to work with a good team. So these are some of the full arch cases that they've done. This is Mike Lino, um, who's the, the, the manager at Shaw. You guys spoke to Ali, who's the president and CEO. And we have Mike Pellegrin, who's one of the reps. Very, very helpful, very knowledgeable people, used to doing multiple crown and bridge implants, full arch treatments. They do amazing work. And they can help guide you through this process. That's what they're there for, right? To help you through that process, okay? Also, you need help with good, your good team. So I couldn't do anything without my office manager, right, Karen, who reviews the cases with the, with, the, with the patients. And then, of course, our assistants. You need to have good assistants, and they need to be trained well to be able to help you throughout the surgery. So again, we were doing mentorship cases, and... You know, we're in the back looking at the, you know, the parts on what drills the doctor is going to use and the assistant's looking with us. And I'm like, there's a patient over here who's drowning in her own blood, who's coughing blood. Maybe you should be looking after her 
and not worrying about what drills and what measurements of the drills are right now, you have to be patient focused and your assistants have to be the same way. Okay, they need to know how to do surgery, how to set up things properly and work together. All right, so here's again, working with a team, prosthetically design things. This is the one guy, okay? And then producing the end result, which are the actual guides. And that was for the same case I showed you guys initially. So the impressions and the guide. Working with good denturists to do conversion. I hate denture work, right? Having an anesthesiologist who can help you, who can get the patient comfortable predictably, okay? This is all part of having a good team, people you can rely on, who have their individual expertise and can get you out of binds and help you manage your patients when you can, or okay? Um, uh, uh, you know, when, when they can. Let me, let me just see here. I thought I saw a question. No, no questions, okay? So in addition, there is a balance here, right? So a balance when we're doing implant therapy between over-engineering a case and then keeping it simple, okay? There's those two kind of, I guess, extremes, right? So there's the extreme of here's a case where you know what, if you put the implant in the better prosthetic position for the tooth so it could get screw retained, or we can angle the implant and then we might not be able to get a screw retained crown. So in this case, I opted for a better prosthetic position, but because we did that, the apex of the implant got very thin, that bone, so I tunneled the area and I add bone. It's a lot of work, man. It's a lot of work. Do you have to do this? No. For me, it's not difficult. It's, I can do that, but you don't want to complicate your life if you don't have to. So place the implant slightly, you know, in the, more in the bone. Sometimes you can even get away with an angled screw channel, right? Or maybe it's a cement retained crown. But to do all this extra stuff, you don't have to do it. So you know, but if you want to over-engineer, sure, right? See how much bone, now I have two to three millimeters of bone all the way around my implant. Here's another case where the patient had implants on the upper right, and you'll see on the upper left, the implants are failing, the bridge is failing. So heavy, heavy occlusion, you can see that its teeth are over-erupted, so to get this back into occlusion, the implant crowns are gonna also have to be in, in, in that situation. So I basically did one implant per tooth, I didn't skip implants. I wanted to over-engineer this case so that it would be solid, okay? And that's kind of the concept of over-engineering. So you'll see on the left and on the right, both of these teeth patients want full arch therapy. This, on the left side is a bit of an older case. You'll see I used a traditional all-on technique. On the right side, you'll see I used additional implants. And that's really what I would do now. For these all-on cases are spending so much money, I'd rather put more implants in and do all-on X than all-on four. Because if one of these implants goes for this lovely lady on the left side, she's screwed, right? She needs a new metal framework, more implants, sinus lifting, all that, when it could have been, wouldn't have been that much more difficult to place additional implants or even at least sinus lift and graft. So in the future, if we need to add implants, there's bone there, okay? So here's again another case of a lower arch, the patient's upper, teeth she didn't want to do anything with. She wants something stable, but she can't afford all on. And she wants a snap on denture. I said, let's do five implants or six implants. Okay. So we did five implants for her. So here's a surgery, spreading them out as much as we can. We kept this lower right tooth just to help hold her partial. And we'll extract that tooth once things have healed. And here are the five implants with adequate AP spread because she's got opposing natural teeth on the top, I wanna to give her as much stability as possible, okay? And when you're treatment plan these cases, I mean, if you're charging 15, 1600 bucks an implant, I'll reduce the cost to like 1400 an implant if they're doing four or more. Sometimes they've even gone down to 13 or 1200 an implant. It doesn't take me that much longer to put an implant in this kind of area, in these areas, okay? And then there's the two week, I just saw her today for a two week healing right? And things are coming along really well for her. Um, so keeping it simple, you know, here's a case. Do we need to sinus lift? Nah, you know, we could, but we don't need to. So keep it simple. Don't. Engage the sinus floor, put the implant in. Don't go packing bone in that area just to see a nice big lift only to find out you perforated. Okay? So keep it simple. But with these kind of cases where you have big lesions and big holes in the bone, learn to walk away. Okay? 
it's okay if you send it out or you don't do those cases or you just graft and come back. It's perfectly acceptable. All right. Cause that's what 99% of the people are doing, including specialists. All right. So I'm going to, maybe I should stop posting cases like this. And so then people will stop asking me if they can do those cases. All right. You need to assess obviously the soft tissue. So you guys know about your flap design. So a case like this where there's thicker tissue on the left compared to thin tissue biotype, when we engineer these types of cases, when we make the flaps, we need to suture them and obviously make sure we have ample, ample amount of bone and thick soft tissue. So this case, actually, we had, I had done performed bone grafting and soft tissue grafting, and uh, you can see the post-op as well. But these are obviously more challenging cases, but you need to assess the soft tissue. When you make your flap design, how are you going to access the area? Does the patient have a high smile line, right? So look at the soft tissue before you look at the bone on the case, and that'll help to kind of guide you as far as what you can do and how you should design your flaps, okay? And then these are the post-op cases, and those are the CTs. Um, so again, because I knew I had to add more bone, I knew I needed to release the tissue to accommodate that. All right. Now we get to assessing the bone. So you'll check what is the difference between these two CT scan reports. Okay. So for those of you who are not familiar or are still uncomfortable reading CTs, you'll see that here it says on the left, it says one millimeter. Uh, sorry, on the right, it says one millimeter slices. And here it's two millimeter slices. It tells you where the buckle and the lingual is, okay? And it puts a little green box and it just gives you a general size. So this, you can print this out and it's life size and you can actually take measurements off of this, all right? The reason why they spaced this two millimeters apart is because there was probably a full quad that they were trying to give you a slice for and they can't put that many slices on one page. So they, they slice every two millimeters. So you have less slices. On the right side, because it was just one tooth, they were able to do one millimeter apart. So every slice is one millimeter. Okay, so assess the bone. Bone comes in different shapes, different sizes, different densities. You can see here. Here's cortical bone on, on the left side. You can see there's cortical on the top, and then it turns into like soft bone or hollow bone at the bottom. Here again, you can say it's kind of in between. There's some softish bone with a buccal bevel. Here you can see it's super cortical bone and then it's completely hollow inside, right? Look at the upper. The upper here, it looks like it's super soft. And when I'm looking through the CT, if you look at the middle slice, you'll see this little palatal projection. You can look for that in the mouth and that'll tell you where you are on the CT. So these little nuances in the CT as you go through the slices can help kind of tell you or guide you as to where you are exactly in the mouth if you're not doing guided surgery, okay? Here again, you can see it's very trabecular bone. Here it's super cortical. Like here, when you drill in this kind of bone, you literally have to prep. If you're placing a four millimeter implant, you gotta prep to like a four and a half to be able to get the implant in, okay? You need to have a backup plan. So if your implant is splitting, you need to have a wider implant, a longer implant. You need to have different size healing abundance, right? So here's a case where, again, this case was super tough. That patient actually is from the U.S. who flew in to have this treatment done because many doctors said it wasn't possible to load teeth on this or give them an all on. So he saw me. We engaged the implants in cortical bone. I even put an extra implant. You can see there's a, a screw or a tax. I have to tack bone and membranes and all this crazy stuff. And I even did bilateral sinus lifting because I was worried if these angled implants fail, then I can at least go back and place more implants. So here's his teeth the same day. Here's a CT scan, um, six, uh, this is actually eight or nine months post-op because of COVID, he got delayed. Um, but you'll see there's so much bone now in the posterior that if his angled implants go, I've got a backup plan. I can put two more implants there, no problem. Okay, and even have got an, another anterior extra one in case too. So again, all of these implants are engaged in cortical bone, um, but you need to have a backup plan, especially when you're being trusted to do these types of procedures and people are spending this kind of money, right? What about this patient? Heavy, heavy bruxer, right? Cut teeth completely gone. We opted to keep the canine, but I, I wanted to give, he has a heavy bite. It's not gonna change when he gets dentures, guys, okay? So we winded up doing additional implants and he paid six for the top, four on the bottom, because he knew when I showed him this picture, 
I said, listen, this is what you're doing to your teeth. That's what you're going to do. This is how your, your, your dentures are going to move around because you're putting so much force. So he wanted something as stable as possible. And I said, six implants spread apart on the top, four on the bottom is going to do really well for you. Okay, I'm not going to dick around with, you know, pardon my French, with two implants on the bottom and three implants on the top. Don't even have that conversation. This is what you need. This is ideal. And give the patient the chance to say yes or no. All right. Remember, I already mentioned this, using cortical bone to stabilize your implants. If you are doing any type of full arch therapy and you're not engaging cortical bone, shame on you, okay? You're doing your patient a disservice. You're not engaging cortical bone. And as a result, you can have failures. When you engage cortical bone, you give the patient an increased chance of your implant uh, uh, you know, being successful and surviving, okay? Sinus repair. If you're doing these cases, you better be damn ready to get in there and do a sinus repair if that's the stuff you're getting into, right? So if you're lifting sinuses, you better know how to repair, whether it's, you know, the basket technique from Picos. I just showed Dr. Patel using tax and we had to repair a huge hole in the sinus last week. Um, but you need to know how to manage these cases because if the patient's sitting in your chair, what do you do? Send them all home, right? I mean, you could do that, but again, you need to feel comfortable treating these cases. All right. So what if the bone's soft under prep, dense of birth, have a variation of sizes of implants, right? That's the biggest thing. Oh, I didn't have that implant size. What if the buccal bone breaks, right? You should be able to regenerate bone. What if I can't get primary stability? You need to be able to go longer or wider. Sinus perforation. There's all these what ifs. What if the bone is moving? Do PRF. What if you can't get blood? You better have a backup plan. <laughs> So these are all things you need to consider when you're treatment planning a case. What if this happens? And then you're gonna be much better prepared for the actual treatment itself. Following a protocol, as you know, I'm a huge stickler on protocol. Here's an example of a case, again, guided surgery, the healing abutments just didn't go down. Simple, didn't follow the protocol. The protocol already tells you, your healing abutments are not gonna seat. Healing abutments were not adjusted, right? So you need to have a proper protocol. Same reason why I say do your periosteal release first and then put your membrane, your bone in your membrane. Don't put your bone, your membrane, and then try to do a periosteal release. Who does that? People who are really good, not me and most of you. It's really hard because by the time you're done doing this, it's bleeding and the bone's moving and the membrane and this and that. It's a disaster. Follow the steps, guys. Follow the steps. Have a protocol. You need to obviously be prepared, okay? So being prepared is super important. You need to be able to tape. So you should tape things up for every surgery, including those who are coming for mentorship. If I say, where's the CT scan? And you're like, oh, it's in my phone. I'm going to be like, get it. <laughs> like, get it. G-I-T it. Like, that's the Harlem way to say, get your ass and get it. Take your gloves off. Stop the surgery. Be prepared. Okay, you need to be prepared. Everything needs to be visible when you're doing the surgery. This is an amazing sheet that actually Dr. Rena Katecha provided during the basic training program. She has a surgical checklist for both the taper kit and the one guide kit. And it goes through every single step that she goes through. And she's one of those doctors that I'm talking about who's just, I've been very proud to say that I've mentored her and she's been able to do more implants than many other doctors because she's following a protocol she follows the steps. And these are some of the things that she, she does to be prepared. This is being prepared, right? This is being prepared to the next level, right? If you're somewhere in between what you're doing right now and this, you're going to be good, <laughs> okay? But if you can take it up a notch, why not? And these are things that I look up to when I see something like this from a doctor who just started doing implants. It's something that I strive for, you know? I go back and have a team meeting and say, guys, we need to have something in writing, okay? Being prepared, your assistants need to have the necessary uh, armamentarium, right? You need to review the setup. What does your surgical setup look like? And you take a picture of it. And now if your assistant is sick and you get, a, you get a staff that's down, guess what? Your treatment planning and all that work that you spend time doing is not going to go by the wayside because now you have everything you need for your surgery. This is a wisdom tooth setup that we have, and it looks the same every time. And this is an implant with sinus lifting setup or an all on setup that we have. And it looks the same every time. Come into my office, take a picture, 
and you take a picture next week, it's gonna look the exact same because that's how it's set up. The 15 blades have to be staggered. There needs to be two. There needs to be two needles out. There needs to be a cast kit out, the dents of burr. There needs to be everything we need, two syringes for saline. There needs to be, like, I can tell you exactly where things are and when I'm gonna use them. And that's how precise you need to be when you're doing surgery, okay? Distractions. You cannot be doing hygiene checks. You cannot say that, oh, you know what? I didn't have enough time to do the surgery or time got in the way and as a result, this is what happened. Okay, or I was rushed, or I didn't. It's not an excuse, guys. You're working on that person you love, right? You need, cannot be distracted. You need to be focused when you're doing surgery, especially if you're not doing it. I can be distracted. You guys have seen me coming to my office. I'm doing 100,000 things and doing a surgery. I'm used to it. I'm doing this every single day. If you're not doing this every single day, then you need to be focused. And I still need to be focused. Don't get me wrong. But there's a tolerance. Everybody has their own tolerance. And my advice would be stay away from distractions. Okay. Make sure you plan your day properly. Have the proper instrumentation. And that's super important because again, you know, a traumatic extraction is easy when you have the right tools, but if you don't, you're going to be there and you're not going to be able to get the tooth out. Okay. Having proper retractors like a Pritchard and a Minnesota or a Bishop's having fine clips or, or needle, uh, needle forceps, to be able to lift tissue gently as opposed to pulling on it. Um, all of these things are important, okay? When you're treatment planning the case, you need to account for additional, additional, additional implants, okay? You need to make sure you have adequate implants and adequate healing abutments. It should never be an excuse that I didn't have this. You should have accounted for that, okay? And, and so that's important to when you're doing any implant, especially for those of you who are doing all on, I can tell you right now, you need to have that stock. You have to, you, there's no option. Okay, because oftentimes the implant you plan is not the one that goes in, all right? So here's a case of my own. I did a guided surgery, I didn't adjust the bone. The healing abutment came loose and the patient was sedated for her initial surgery and I had to bring the patient back and freeze them up. It was a nightmare and it didn't look very good on me. So make sure your healing abutments are seated properly. Make sure you contour the bone, whether it's the, the bone profiler. I like, again, a high speed. So you put a cover screw on and use a high speed surgical round. And then make sure that it's seated properly. You know these problems are going to happen. Why do you want to see the patient two weeks later to have the healing button come off or a complication? Okay. Take photos. You need to take intro photos using your guide pins, different angulations when the patient's biting down and function, even looking at the occlusal view looking for sinus perforations, looking for angulations for all on, for the prosthetic emergences, for your access screws. Um, again, parallelism so that you can give the patient a good result, okay? And then of course, when you take pictures, especially x-rays, using them. So this is a case that I did. You can see the one, two, the guide pin is slightly off. Well, if I actually looked at the guide pin and I used the guide pin, I would have said Azim, you need to use your Lindemann and recorrect the angle. And clearly I didn't because the occlusal looked good, but the implant still went in slightly on an angle. It's still acceptable, but I'm not happy with that. And this is my own example of a case that wasn't done that long ago that I still need the reminders to re look at the x-ray, really look at the x-ray and evaluate it. Okay. In this case, I did evaluate the x-ray. And as a result, I used my Lindemann to move the implant over so that we can follow the treatment plan, which is giving the patient crowns in the proper prosthetic position, okay? Also, when you're treatment planning a case, remember when you're treatment planning, you need to have adequate inventory. You also need to remember your torque values. You need to write them in your treatment plan um, as far as what your expectations are, but also once you perform the therapy, write them in. This doctor actually performed an implant and a tooth in a day, didn't get the ISQ that he wanted. So he then went ahead and removed the temporary, um, you know, the temporary uh, crown, put a healing abutment on, decided I'm just gonna graft the one, two implant. When he went to take out the healing abutment, guess what came out? The implant. So he winded up having to place, now he didn't have the stock, he didn't have a 13, he only had an 11 and a half, three and a half millimeter by 11 and a half. That's what went in that day because he didn't have a 13 or whatever. So 
again, having adequate stock and planning and, and, and really why did you not get the right torque? So assessing the bone and it can happen to all of us, but I guarantee you, if you had a 13 or 15 millimeter implant here and he could have gone a bit deeper, he could have got really good torque again. Okay. So following up, you need to have a proper follow-up schedule for your place patients. So when you initially treatment plan the case, you need to tell a patient, I need to see you back one or three weeks later. So I do one week and three week. If it's a hard case, two weeks, if it's like a standard case, I'm not too worried about minimal grafting. Then I do everybody at six weeks, which is a month and a half and four months, okay? Remember, you can only write the test once. So you can only go in there and write the, you only have one chance to do the surgery, right? Okay, so if you don't have time to do it right now, then are you gonna have time to do it over? Because I can tell you, many of us have gone through that and said, oh my God, you know, now I got to see the patient back for a post-op and now there's a swelling and now an implant comes out and now the bone graft has failed. If we would have just taken the time and done things really, really diligently in the beginning, I can assure you, you won't have these issues or they'll be less frequent. Okay. So here's again a case, reevaluate and single implant, reevaluate the case at two weeks or even one week. You can see here, I'm getting some tissue irritation from the gut. So I'm like, ah, you know, maybe I'm gonna move to monochrome now. Evaluate your cases. Here's another case, a larger case, huge grafting, immediate molar implants. I look at the case surgically, I'm like, yeah, it looks pretty good while it's sutured, and yep, it healed really well. Okay, but look at this case. All right, meet Gina, again, loves to take pictures of her cases, huge buccal defect, I grafted, everything was sutured. Her tissue was so thin, I didn't grab enough tissue. She went and sent me three selfies of her case and the site opened up. The suture opened up. Now I got to monitor because that in most cases, you're just monitoring the case, letting it heal. And that's where she's at right now. And I told her, I said, you might need a free gingival graft later on, but we'll have to assess the case as it heals. Okay, here's another case. Place the implant, not a lot of bone. The sutured the case, I thought really well patient went and cut out two sutures because they were bothering him. Yeah, cut out two sutures. That's what happened. The site completely opened up from the buckle. The bone kind of was semi-exposed. I'm like, I don't know what the hell to do at this point. The implant is anchored in his, in his sinus floor. So we had like 60 Newtons on this implant. Let it heal, soft tissue perfect except the buckle. I said, listen, let's take the implant out, let's start over. He's like, no. I said, fine, let's do a free gingival graft. That's what we did. So we thickened up the tissue and he knows he has a compromised result and he signed off on it. Okay. But you don't see these things happen if you're not following up and taking pictures with your cases. Here's another case with a patient, heavy, heavy occlusion. He wants a full set of teeth. Well, to give him this, we had to over engineer his case. Okay. We had to put seven implants on the top, six implants on the bottom, give him adequate room, open up his vertical, Again, working with a good team and over-engineering initially at the treatment planning phase. This case, I wouldn't do 22,000 for a single arch. I would charge them 27. More implants, more bone, more work. So this is all part of your treatment planning stage. Because if you don't do that properly, you're going to lose time, money, confidence, trust. And trust me, you're going to get stressed even more. Okay? So the last key is learning from your mistakes and others. You know, that's what I love about this group. Nobody's judgmental. Everybody's open and sharing and we learn from each other. Okay. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you have to learn. Okay. The key is learning and not repeating the same mistake because you're not going to get a different result. And that's what I do when my surgeries is I take pictures and I learn from them so I can do better next time. And that's important. You need to learn. Mistakes are okay, but you need to learn from them. Okay, so here's a case. I placed an implant for a good friend of mine. She's actually, um, uh, she actually models part-time. So of course we had to do an anterior for her and we did the anterior, we did the crown and about a year and a half later, she came back to me and she had pus and exit coming out of the buckle of the implant. And so when I took a CT, the buckle bone had collapsed. I didn't place the implant palatal enough. This is about maybe eight, nine years ago. So I opened up the case. I exposed you. You can see the implant shining through the bone, and she had this peri implantitis at the crest. There was also some cement extrusion. 
So I removed the cement, cleaned out the implants as best I could, grafted some bone, covered it up with a membrane and sutured it. And thank God things healed well, because if she got recession, this could have been a nightmare. She's got a high spine line. So these again, happen to the best of us. Our goal is to set the cases up as best we can and plan for the worst, right? When you're treatment planning. So failure is temporary guys, you know, things go wrong all the time and it's okay. Um, it doesn't mean we need to give up. And I know some of you are, are listening to this right now and you're like, oh God, he's talking about me, you know, and you know who you are. I don't want to do implants anymore, or I've shied away from taking out wisdom teeth or whatever, because I got scared. Um, don't get scared. Okay. Choose your cases properly. Um, you know, observe cases and um, learn because guess what? You could, you can do it. You can do a lot of these things um, that you think you can't. You just need to start doing it the right way. Okay. And, and, and fortunately many do the wrong way and then they get discouraged and give up. Okay. And that's not what we want. So a few case examples. Okay. So this is just a standard case example. This patient's missing a tooth. So we would treat and plan the implant in the optimal prosthetic position. I would also look at the quality of the bone. I'd say, ah, you know, I want to do a five by 10. Apical bone is a bit soft here, but everything should go pretty straightforward. And it did. Okay. We used our guide pin. We lined everything up in the middle. We placed our implant and everything went really smoothly. So that's a pretty straightforward case. Again, I don't say any case is straightforward, but again, the nuances here are the bone, the shape of the bone, the depth of the implant placement, um, and these are things that we need to consider. And then of course, our incision moving the soft tissue to the buckle to give us a bit more cratinized tissue. Um, medical history as well. Um, you need to make sure you go through the medical history and uh, you can write a letter to the family physician as well. That could be part of your treatment planning phase and it should be if you're concerned about their cardiovascular status. You can even get medical approval. Actually, now you can't because they won't fill out these forms anymore. So I'll take that out. Um, or it's really hard to get it anyways, um, the medical doctors to fill it out. So you can always get them to fax something over to you. And then this is a, a consent form, right? Talks about the risk benefits, the maintenance. I, I've agreed that I need to come in for cleanings and that it's not included in the treatment. Okay. And, uh, and again, we include a rhododent. So there's four pages. The first three pages are written. And then this page says, I read those pages. Okay. Um, so getting to treatment planning, this is a case you might see in your office, right? Patient comes, uh, the upper left, the two five is loose. Okay. Her pay, her, believe it or not, her doctor sent a treatment plan for a three, eight post core and crown. Yeah. That's what she brought in with her. Okay. And these are her pictures. So I'm assuming most of you are not going to try to restore the three, eight. Her two five is toast. It's mobile. And she's got a four, six. If you look at the lower right, that's just, she keeps getting food stuck in. So I just told her, I said, listen, you need a crown on the lower right. It's a huge filling. We might need to do crown lengthening, but you definitely need a new core and a crown, right? We'll try to build up some nice contact. On your upper left, your premolar is shot. In fact, her molar also has recurrent caries on the distal, her 2.7. Uh, her 3.8 is toast. I told her it's, it's done. Like that tooth's got to go. So she said, well, what are you going to do for me on my left side? How am I going to chew? So I proposed a treatment plan. I said, based on your occlusion, I think we should remove the 2.5 because it needs to be removed. How post and core done. And we give you two implants that can function with your first molar. Okay. The three, eight needs to go. And the two, seven is just there. I mean, I would just remove it at this point because you're not chewing with it. Unless she opts to do an implant in the three, seven, then we would need to add another implant on the top. So I tell her, Anna, what's your budget? What do you want to spend here? Two implants. Let's say there's seven or 8,000 bucks. Add another 4,000 for another implant on the top and another four on the bottom. What's your budget here? And she said, you know what? My budget is this. So we're just going to do the two implants for her on there and we'll do the crown on her lower right. Okay. So treatment planning kind of comes down to function because that's for her main concern was function. It comes down to where we can get implants safely for function and what is the patient prepared to spend. Okay. And that's kind of how I treatment plan from a general standpoint. So this is Helen who also came in just last week for a consult. She has moderate wear on her teeth. She had a bridge from the one four to the one six. 
sorry, the one three to the one six, okay? And the one three had massive caries. The dentist sectioned the bridge in the middle of the premolars, okay? And uh, the canine was toast, so she made a temporary crown with a pontic sticking off the end of it. And so the patient came to see me with a treatment plan from the dentist saying, please replace one three, one four, and one five, right? Because she's been missing the one four and the one five for a while. So I went ahead and took some intro photos, which are very valuable, as I mentioned. And lo and behold, on the two six, or the one six, I see palatal recession and recurrent caries, okay? So now I really want to investigate this site properly. So I want to take a CT scan. Before I do that, she sends me over some PAs. And I really wanted to get some x-rays of the other side, because guess what, guys? Whatever is happening on the left side, or the right side, is probably the same thing happened or is going to happen on the left side. So on the, I called up the dentist and on the left side, her two six had been root amputated and she's on two roots with a crown because she had an infection around one of the roots. So this is telling me already the one six is not looking so good. I take some study models, I mount the case, I assess the inclusion, I look at the CT and lo and behold, there's an issue with the one six. The report came back. So here's the one three that needs to be removed. Again, thin bone. So I know there might be a buccal plate dehiscence here. Okay. The one four, super thin, has a root. The one five is a little bit wider, but it's still not very wide at all. So we're going to have to do either some ridge expansion here to be able to get an implant in. And the one six has frication bone loss, furcal bone loss, and rarefying osteitis, but there's some pretty good septal bone. So her treatment plan, what we determined after the CT report came back showing the 1-6 was no good, was a comprehensive treatment plan treating the 1-3 to the 1-6 as well, okay? And we'll do three implants to, to do a bridge for her, all right? So Again, just from a treatment planning perspective, how I'm looking at things and looking at the big picture, even though the patient or even sometimes the dentist is saying, no, just this, you need to look at the big picture. Here's an immediate implant. Again, there's no bone here. So this is a case for you to just graft. Because if you get into a situation like this, with an immediate, you're going to have to know how to expose the site, clean the defect, get stability apically using the floor of the sinus and then graft all this bone, okay? Same thing with immediate molar. When you look at a molar, all right, assess the case. You can see here on the lower uh, molar site that there's some bone loss. So this is the four um, seven, or this is the four six. You can see there's barely any bone on the buckle. There's bone for the four seven, but it's tight, okay? And when we treatment plan this case, it even tells you four, six after the extraction should require bone grafting because there will be some buccal defects. So you decide, you want to do a case on the left where there could be a big bone buccal defect and you're going to have to manage that and graft and suture and all that stuff. Or would you rather start with a case that is contained? And that's where I mean case selection. Don't bite off more than you can chew just because that's the case that you have. Okay. So what would you rather choose? Same thing goes for immediate anterior. This is the case I just did. Uh, I don't have the surgical pictures, but we just treated this patient um, uh, on the 2-2, the, the, the tooth broke. So again, we just kept it simple. There's buccal bone here. The tooth looks fairly straightforward to extract, although you never say that before you start the surgery. And we place an immediate implant compared to something like this, where there's recession and there's inflammation and edematous tissue, and there's an apical lesion, right? These are cases that are very challenging to do, and they require more advanced techniques, and you need to be able to deliver the end result. So again, I would stay away, and this is the final, okay? Same thing, indirect sinus, right? Like grafting the bone and then placing an implant with the casket is more predictable than trying to place an implant the same day and doing sinus lifting, all right? Again, it comes with experience. So where do you start? You know, I've seen some doctors say, I want to do this case. And there's like two millimeters of bone. Well, that's a hard case for me. And I've done close to 600 lifts. So don't start off. And now on top of that, you have a buccal defect. Clearly, you're setting yourself up for sleepless nights. Okay. Here's a case that, again, we just treated. The patient came in on the upper right, 
has a 1-4 that's rotated in crossbite. The 1-6 has got an apical lesion. The 1-7 he's already had extracted. So he wants to restore this upper right. But guess what? He wants to keep the 1-4. I said, you want to keep the 1-4? It's got perio. It's got moderate bone loss. It's rotated. It's not in proper occlusion. We need to take the 1-4 out. And we had many discussions about this. And finally, he agreed after I sent him a copy of the CT report showing moderate bone loss. But how do we manage a case like this? This is not a case that you would start off with. If you can't see the end result, then don't take a case on like this. Because this case involved sectioning the crowns. And that was hard getting the teeth out. Placing the implants in the optimal position. And there's buccal defects here. Spacing the implants properly. And this is done all freehand without a guide. Sinus lifting. And when, when do we sinus lift? We can't extract the roots because if we extract the roots and get a sinus perforation, then we have no hydraulic pressure. So when do we sinus lift? Where do we sinus lift? Now there's buccal defects. So how do we graft the bone, right? There's so much stuff involved in these types of cases. And here's again, the sinus lifting. You can see I kept the tooth in purposely and I lifted the two sites first before I actually finished all the implant sites. And again, I'll go through this within a sinus lifting course. I think we have one in London coming up, okay? But don't get into these, all right? They're more challenging cases. Here's Nicola, he wanted implants. He has a heavy bite, Italian guy. I said, sure, we can do four and four, but wouldn't five or six be better? And he said, yes, I want as much support as possible. And that's what we did. Same thing with Bert, solid guy, drove all the way down from my hometown, Elliott Lake. I said, you know what? We put four implants in, but one of them was a little, wasn't as stable because he had a large area of infection. So we put five implants for him, one no charge. Again, over-engineering. Same thing for JJ, right? Sure, we can keep implants in the anterior zone, in the premolars, but by doing crustal sinus lifting, we can go ahead and we can spread our implants further posteriorly. You can see this site I grafted and this site I just put PRF because it was a narrow sinus. And now look at the AP spread, and now he's gonna have a really nice stable denture. Okay, so this is all part of our treatment planning to give the patient the best result. Okay, and he has a snap-on denture. What about the more advanced cases? For those of you guys who are more advanced, how do we treatment plan a case like this, which is an all on, like a full arch? And the way we do that is a traditional denture setup. We set up a denture, we, make, we, we establish the vertical, we then go ahead and we create a surgical stent or a duplicate with some cutouts and some markings as far as where we need as far as prosthetic height. And we use those cutouts during the surgery to determine the implant positioning and the implant depths as well. Okay, once we place our implants and we ensure that our access holes are coming out through those channels or through the, the ideal areas through the emergence holes, okay, and that's what we're checking, we then do a pickup with somebody who knows what the hell they're doing, okay? Whether it's a direct technique, this is a direct technique where we picked up all of them. You can do an indirect technique. Then we need to graft the bone and then we need to suture this. So these are more advanced cases. And again, when we have the temporary built, this is done by somebody who knows what they're doing. This is the lower arch, okay? Um, there's the lower. And then there's the upper. And again, over engineering, right? We do six implants if we can. But you need to make sure that the surgery ideally should take, you know, if, if you're first starting out, your initial surgery may take about four or five hours for an arch. Once you get good, the goal is to get down to about two to three hours an arch. Your conversion, if it's a direct conversion, which means a conversion is being done. And again, this comes to treatment planning and how you're spacing out your IV sedation time and your surgical time, your direct technique is gonna take a bit longer. Your indirect may not take as long, but it depends on who's doing it. And these are things that I'm not gonna get into too much, but they are a valuable, a critical part, I should say, for your treatment planning on how the conversion is gonna get done when you're treatment planning these cases and who's doing it. You need to have that discussion with whoever's doing it. Okay, so you can get a good result, but you're not keeping the patient there forever. All right, same thing with a case like this, severe perio, nothing at the back. How are we gonna get implants in here? So angled implants are really hard. So to do that, take PAs, it's okay. You can take a PA during surgery and see where you're at. 
See if you're hugging that anterior wall and then continue your osteotomy and account for that width of the implant that's going to enlarge, okay? And then again, we, we, you know, we place our implants. This is an indirect technique where we're actually taking an impression, a full arch impression. Um, there's an easy bar system where you can do a Duralay so you can get a nice, good impression. So you can do um, you know, the pickup on, on a model, okay? And then you give the patient the end result. Of course, for the lower, you need to be comfortable exposing mental nerve in these cases. Again, placing your angled implant so you can see where your mental nerve is, and then using the prosthetic as a guide to determine how much reduction you need. Um, and in this case, obviously, we had to remove an implant or two, right? Or, you know, so these cases are more challenging, all right? But treatment planning is the first step, and it involves your team, and your team needs to know what they're doing so they can give the patient the best result. And this is the final prosthetic for her. Okay, so. I'll leave off with measure twice, okay? So with treatment planning, treatment plan, walk away, come back and treatment plan it again and see what you get, okay? Cut once and then do what the dudes do, which is force it and then it'll fit. Okay, well don't do that. But you get what I mean, right? Really think long and hard before you start getting into um, your cases, okay? So um, uh, that's uh, pretty much it for our lecture, just on treatment planning. I hope the, the information was of use. Um, I'm just gonna uh, finish up with, make sure you hit up our events calendar. There are some great surgeries coming up. As I mentioned, we're limiting it to one doctor right now, and you have to have all your PPE, including N95, because uh, we're on stage two modified. Um, uh, this is our calendar, so this is what we still have left. Our next meeting, hopefully, is gonna be on suturing and um, it'll be focusing on instrumentation, um, sutures, so what type of suture material, when, uh, you know, when to suture uh, during the surgery, and then where, where, where to suture, um, and the techniques, and more importantly, how to tie knots. I think that's one of the biggest things that people struggle with, depending on the material, what they, should they choose, what should they use, and then how to tie it properly, okay? So um, we're going to go through that, and hopefully it'll be hands-on, but I'll keep you posted. Just, I will send out the email. So um, confirmation, if it's, in, if it's live, um, then of course we'll need that from you. So just respond back to the email, yes or no. Um, but it's all a very fluid situation given COVID right now. Um, we'll find out whether we can do a live, um, uh, you know, live meeting or not. Okay, and if we can, trust me, I'll make it happen. All right, so just make sure you hit up the website uh, and uh, check out the, the Facebook uh, page as well. All right, guys? So I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen here. And um, like I said, I hope that this stuff was beneficial. Um, and I hope you guys picked up on some good points. Um, does anybody have any uh, questions or any um, concerns? One question from Christina Azim. She asks, if one needed to change a healing abutment, when can we do it time frame wise so for changing, so for implants, generally what I tell patients is, or what I tell people is with the first two weeks is fair game. If you get a good torque within the first two weeks, you can kind of do whatever you want. After that, I would be a little bit skeptical on doing any type of changes, twerking, anything like that on the implant uh, for, and then wait for two months. So that's why I encourage you to see a patient at the one to two week mark for sure. Because at that point, if something's going on, you can, you can go in and you can modify things, even hand tighten if, if you did like an anterior uh, you know, implant, temporary crown, you can go back and really tighten it back up. Again, remembering what twerk, because you wrote that in your chart, right? Um, so uh, yeah, the first two weeks, I think you can, you're, you're pretty safe respecting your torque value. After that, I would be a bit hesitant on really going crazy on things, okay? All right, guys, so I believe, are there any other questions? No other questions. Just a couple of comments about sharing those forms that you talked about um, during, the, uh, during the lecture. Like sure, the, uh, so what I'm gonna do, guys, is I'm actually gonna review um, the, the chat form. And, um, oh, did you guys see the, uh, the CE code? The CE code is Odin, oh crap, you know what? Hang on, let me just pull it up. I will tell you guys what the CE code is in a second. I'm just gonna write it out here. It is, so just make sure you guys take note of that. It is October 21st, 2020, Odin, okay? So just make sure you guys take a note of that so that we, uh, you guys have that, okay? 
uh, as a record. Um, and then, like I said, I'll issue the C. As far as, um, uh, sorry, the, 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 I'll, look through the pre I'll look through the chat and any forms where people said, hey, can you please send that form? I will uh, put that form in like a document and I will send that out on a group chat. Okay, awesome. thank um, you. I might just attach it onto the CE, uh, CE form and then that way you guys can use it. I'll try to send it as a Word document so you guys can just modify it as you see fit. Thank you. Okay. And, and those are all the questions and comments. Okay, perfect guys you, and girls. Um, well, thank you guys so much for your time. I wanted to thank Hisham. Always, Hisham's always helping me out, so thanks a lot, buddy. Um, and I'm looking forward to the next one. As I mentioned, I really hope today was helpful. I hope it was beneficial. I tried not to just go on with the regular treatment planning stuff that you hear everywhere else. I tried to touch on the key pearls that really can help give you that edge to develop a better treatment plan and give yourself better, more confidence when you're, when you're presenting a case or even just looking at a case. And as you always know, I'm always here to help out. Our group chat forum is very active. You can always post a case there and nobody's ever here to judge. Um, but remember, learn from our mistakes, others' mistakes so that we can do better for our patients and do better for yourselves and gain more confidence. Okay, so I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. Um, those of you who are doing the mentorship program next month, I'm looking forward to seeing you and helping you guys grow your careers. Otherwise, have a wonderful evening and I look forward to seeing you guys hopefully in person very soon. All right, thank you guys very much. Have a great night. Take care.